What's going on, everybody? <clears throat> Welcome to the stream. I'm Ian Douglas. I forgot to change the screen in the background. There we go. Me and Douglas from the author of that website, Tech Interview Dog Guide, and tonight we're actually going to redesign that website a little bit. Um, so I want to pick a new sort of theme for the website. Uh, probably stick with the same colors. I can go in and tweak the, the style sheet afterward and do the, the color on it. Uh, but want to kind of redesign the layout of, of what's there. Um, it's kind of it's kind of in the right order that I want. Uh, where you know section one is like introduction to the whole thing section two is about prep section three is about actually doing the interviews and section four is like what happens after the interview um, but I've got a lot of YouTube videos that I've been making over the last year and a half or more of streaming uh, that I would like to incorporate into the website um, and I also want to change the the actual theme of the website um, because having so on the on the very edges of the website it's got this backward and forward kind of thing because originally I was writing it as a book. And so I wanted a way to have it uh, let people go from page to page without needing to put a control at the bottom of every page saying, here's a link to the next page and having to maintain that all the time because then as soon as you change a page, something breaks and now suddenly people can't get to a bunch of your website. And so I wanted the website to kind of do that automatically based on how it was kind of laying everything out with the with a static site builder that I use called Hugo. And uh, so I want to I want to change that up, but I want to make it easy for people to sort of get through the different sections and then within a section go through all the different sort of chapters of the book. Um, but I, I want to design this out in a way that it makes a little more logical sense for, you know, if this is where you're at in the job hunt and this is where you're having problems, here's here's the advice that I have. Um, so I thought what I would do tonight is actually start working on that redesign a little bit, or at least the plan of that redesign. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I mean, everyone's always welcome to interrupt and, and ask, uh, ask interview related questions or career related questions as we go. Uh, we got the pew pew machine uh, going up here. That's been working great. Uh, so you can do exclamation point pew pew and, uh, and that'll uh, see the lights blink. Um, what else is going on? I've got some 3D prints going on right now. I picked up another stream deck. So I've got two of the 15 key stream decks and I've got a stream deck XL now, which is 32 keys. And I wanted some way of sort of laying them out a little bit nicer. And I thought, well, when I upgraded a, a Prusa printer a while back, I ended up with these leftover extrusions that I didn't need. And so is there a way that I could like somehow reconnect these two pieces together and then somehow mount the stream decks on top of this? like? You know, if, if it's sitting on the desk like this, have a way of like tipping it back or whatever uh, this way and, and laying it out. So I put them all side by side and I measured it out and it was about 16 inches. Well, guess what? This is 16 inches as well. Um, and then I thought, well, I need some way of stabilizing it. And I also had these smaller extrusions left over. And so I wanted a way to sort of build a T joint out of that. And so I spent a little bit of time uh, doing some modeling and doing some thinking about what I wanted to sort of build and model out for that. <clears throat> and, uh, and basically came to uh, design like a little T intersection uh, that's 3D printed. So it'll kind of cap on the end of this and then allow me to put a couple of what we call T nuts inside of the, the actual track here. And then uh, this will lay over over the the top and then i can put screws or bolts in the track and hold that t-joint together and then that will be you know a stable leg or whatever for for this thing actually i guess it'd be this way because it's a shorter one um and so we get that on both sides and then we would end up with this thing and then i thought well instead of just joining these pieces together what if i could you know introduce like a slight angle on it so that, you know, as it's sitting on the desk, it's not like a big, long, straight thing, but that, you know, it's kind of curved a little bit towards me on the desk. Um, well, I found someone's design that actually made a connector that, you know, friction fits into these tracks and, and would allow you to combine both of these. And so basically I took their model and I cut it in half and I kind of uh, introduced a, a 30 degree angle and then filled that triangle part in with plastic. And uh, so that's printing right now. It's almost done. Oh, it is done. Let me go grab that.
Perfect timing. And my maker desk is really messy and junky right now. So this is the little key connector that I made for the end. I had to put some support material on it for reasons that I will show. Um, basically for the, for the countersinking of the bolts that's going to go in there that it won't impact the other track of what we're connecting this to. <clears throat> and so it's basically cleared out. Just got to get that one little piece out of there. And then uh, I've got a really big, giant, multicolor print uh, going right now as well. So we'll have, uh, have some fun with that. We'll dive in and, and uh, take a look at that in a little bit. Um, cool. So this is the, the end piece that I made. Um, and so this end piece has a little peg on it. And that peg is basically going to sit inside this middle hole on the larger extrusion. And then these four screw holes are going to line up with the four extrusions here. And hopefully that fits. It fits. All right. And do those screw holes line up? Indeed they do. And so now those screw holes are going to line up going down the track. Uh, it's a little hard to show you on the stream, but I promise they're going to line up. Um, and the reason that I had to kind of make these dug out a little bit is because the screw head has to be able to fit down inside of that, that piece. And those holes are going to be a little tight. They'll work out okay. Um, but I needed a way for the screw head to be sort of sunk down in there because the flat part of this, so I've got the part with the peg that's going to go into that extrusion. But when I put the bolts in here, I need that to not interfere with connecting it onto this part. And so those screws have to be countersunk in there. And then on the flip side, I also made little countersinks for those bolts as well, that when they fit into this, um, that they'll go all the way down. It'll be nice and flat. Um, not that it'll, it won't be as important on, on that side, but... Uh, but I was experimenting with some uh, with ironing effects on the bamboo, and uh, it came out really nice. So the bottom of it came out textured because I use a textured plate. But check out the top. The top of that is like smooth as glass. It's ridiculous how smooth that got. So I printed two of those because there's two ends, <clears throat> and then this is the 30 degree connector that uh, I basically took this other person's design and, and broke it apart. This has a lot more support material in it um, just because of the way that it has to fit into the extrusions. And I'm hoping that the tolerances on this are actually going to fit in those little grooves. So we'll, uh, we're going to break this apart and we're going to see how well this is actually going to uh, fit in here. Um, so yeah, while I'm nerding out on this stuff um, and working on the website design, you are more than welcome to interrupt me and ask questions about career advice. Uh, interview prep, anything along those lines. My Thursday night streams, you can always, always interrupt me. And if I'm not staring at the screen, if I got my head down like this and I'm working on stuff, you are absolutely welcome to uh, use a channel point redemption that uh, will get my attention. And it's just called Ahem. So you can redeem that if you want, and it just plays a little sound and it lets me know that I need to pay attention to chat. Um, for those visiting on Twitch, You'll also see that we, uh, we started our fundraiser for 2023. Um, and the first group that I did some research on that uh, we're going to contribute to is a company called Unloop. And uh, their mission is basically to help people who have been in prison get jobs in tech. Um, and uh, I think it's, it's a very noble uh, sort of cause. And so I'm happy to support them. And uh, so if you want to donate, you're welcome to donate. And then as always, I'll be matching any donation funds that come in for that, um, I'll be matching that uh, as we go. So I, I may not necessarily see who donates, but, uh, but I will be able to see if people donate. And then I'll go in and I'll match that money. So right now it's set to a $2,000 goal, but that's like 1000 for you. And then I'll match 1000 on that. And uh, we'll let that run as long as it takes. Once that's done, I've got another organization lined up, and it's called STEM to the Future. 
And it's basically going to help black and Latino kids learn about STEM careers and get them prepared to uh, get into STEM jobs and, uh, and STEM education and so on and provide resources for them. Um, so that'll be the next group that we're going to, uh, that we're going to donate to once, uh, once the first donation is finished up. Wow, this support material is really on there. So I use, uh, I use a support material on the bamboo. <clears throat> the, the bamboo printers came with some support material from bamboo, um, but they only give you like 250 grams of it. So it runs out really fast. And so uh, what, I, what I ended up doing is uh, purchasing a bunch of Polymaker support material that they produce, but it's almost always out of stock. And so I usually have like a couple of rolls of it at any given time because I, I generally have one on each printer. And then um, it's, uh, it's just, it's, a, it's really fantastic support material. And, uh, but they made a change in the software that when you tell it that you're using a support interface layer, um, basically what it does is it'll, It'll start the, um, the support material in whatever filament that you're using. But as it gets close to the bridge or whatever it actually needs to support, it'll switch the filament over to the support material, which doesn't stick to PLA. Um, and so the next, like the last layer or two of the support material that bumps right up underneath what you're trying to support is this material that doesn't stick to PLA. It melts like PLA. And it stays in place like PLA, but it doesn't stick to PLA permanently. And so it makes it really easy to, to break away. Uh, the problem is there's some really tiny little nitpicky uh, little crevices and so on in this model. Um, I also decided to use the carbon fiber PLA on this model uh, to print this instead of just regular PLA. Probably because it was, it was black and my extrusions are black, so I kind of wanted to keep it all dark. Um, but also, um, from what I'm told, PLA has a natural tendency to shrink after a while. And apparently the carbon fiber filled PLA helps reduce the amount of shrinkage that happens on the PLA material. And I thought, well, if this is going to be a, a, you know, like a functional print, then I better do something like that. So I decided to use the carbon fiber PLA and hope that the tolerances on it are okay. Um, and then the other bamboo is doing an eight color print. Um, I was on Brit's channel the other day. Brit changed her username, so she's not Sith Lord Brit anymore. She is Creatrix Brick Brit. And uh, on her stream, she's showing off this really cool treasure chest with a tentacle on it. And uh, I'm like, where'd you get that model? And she's like, it's a Patreon model. <clears throat> and she shared the link in her chat. So I immediately went and backed the, uh, the creator. And um, I got a copy of their model. Hey, Whip, how's it going? Good to see you. And uh, got a copy of the model and immediately went to work uh, digitally painting it. So if, you, if anybody here follows me on Twitter, you'll have seen the, uh, the digital print of it um, or the digital painting of, of what I put together. And, uh, and then I, I posted a, a small follow-up picture like, the following morning or whatever after it had been printing. But uh, if we go over to the screen, <clears throat> you'll actually see it printing over there. So that's the multicolor uh, tentacle uh, treasure chest or something it's called. It's called like tentacle treasure chest, if I remember right. And uh, it's a really great model. Like the, the person that put it together is, did, did a really, really good job on it. Um, it's basically a, a treasure chest with a lid that kind of closes up. So the lid is printing on the back part of the model. So the back part here that I'm kind of pointing to, and it'll actually like fold over the top. Um, so it's, it's a really, really interesting model. Uh, it'll, be, it'll be really neat to check out once it's done. And I'm debating once it's finished, making that one of our first like big giveaways for 2023. So I got to let it finish printing and then see you know, how well it does and how good the print quality is and things like that. Um, but I may give that away. <clears throat> uh, what else? This week I also uh, reserved a table 
and bought tickets for the Rocky Mountain Rep Rep Festival. So the RMMRF uh, that's happening in April. I'm looking forward to that. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, and uh, so I'm going to, I was originally just going to get tickets just to attend. And then someone talked me into getting a table. And they're like, well, you should just bring a table and like show off the stuff that you print and whatever. So I'm like, okay, well, that means I got to print a bunch more stuff. So I got to get some more dragons going, things like that, that I can, uh, I can sell or give away or whatever at the show. Um, but I was asking one of the organizers, hey, do you know if anybody else is bringing a bamboo printer to the festival? And they said, well, so far we only know of one person bringing a bamboo. And I said, well, why don't I get a table and I'll bring both of my bamboos and that way people can see it in action. They're like, oh, that'd be great because we're worried that that one person that was bringing their bamboo, that their table is going to get like jam packed all the time. And, you know, it's going to be so busy that people aren't actually going to get to see the thing in action. So I'm going to take both of my bamboo printers to this Rep Rep Festival because it's only like an hour away from my house. Um, so I thought, well, I better, better get a table then and not just, uh, not just tickets to attend. So the tolerances on this thing are really, really tight. Like trying to get in here and get the support material out of this print is going to be ridiculous. So I might have to reprint this without support or with a lot less support. Like I might have to go in and be very strategic about where I actually build in support material because this is actually really hard to get out of here. So Whip, what's going on? Haven't seen you in uh, in chat in a little while. What's, uh, what's going on in your world? What's new with... Uh, What's new with you? Um, so yeah, as always, if I got my head down and I'm, you know, working on a print or cleaning up a print like this, um, I know I don't have it on camera, but uh, I've been trying to reorganize my cameras and my desk and stuff like that. So um, I wanted to kind of at least face the screen so I can see chat when it happens. Um, but you are absolutely welcome to interrupt what I'm doing at any time. Say hi, say howdy, tell a joke, um, anything like that. There's lots of channel point redeems to do. There's some Easter eggs on the platform if you want to like dig in and try to find some of those. Um, yeah, gosh, this is not going to work well. So I'm probably going to have to go in and reprint this one piece uh, with less or no support material and hope for the best um, because I'm not even going to be able to get this in the extrusion at this rate. But from a tolerance point of view, I want to see how well it's at least going to fit, or if it fits. And the whole thing is way too big. This is supposed to fit 30-30 extrusion, and the size of it is 30 by 30. So it's not going to fit in the track. I need to actually make this even smaller still. If I make it even smaller, that support material is going to be absolutely impossible to take out of here. So yeah, I need to shrink the whole thing by a fair bit. So if I've got something that's 30 by 30, and I need to make it at least 28 by 28, if not smaller. My calipers. There. Is that extrusion? 2.1 millimeters. So I need to go from 30 millimeters to 25.8. I need to make that even smaller. 25.8. So the good news is I can do a lot of that right in the slicer. Let me go over my slicer here for a sec. So those parts printed great. And then this part, I'm going to scale. And that's going to be, what did I say, 25.8? Let's do 25.75. We'll give ourselves a little extra room on there. So it's bringing everything down to 85% scale. Um, let's see, what am I going to do for support material? I definitely need some amount of support material inside of it, but maybe not to the extent that I thought. So I'm just going to go ahead and paint some supports real quick. And then... Uh, We'll get back into the website stuff. So thanks for bearing with me. 
Um, I don't have chat on screen for a sec, so I'll be not paying attention to chat just for a moment while I do this quick digital painting and then reprint this model. Hope everybody's doing well. Um, so yeah, Whip, I hadn't uh, hadn't seen you on the uh, on the stream for a little bit. Hope you're doing good. Happy New Year. Hope you get uh, get some fun plans for the new year. You got some neat uh, projects or ideas or anything like that going on. Feel free to let us know in chat. Yeah, there's definitely some overhangs here that are going to need some support. But for the most part, this is going to be fine. That's got one end of it painted. And spin that around to the other side. And we'll get that thing going. Sorry for being uh, quiet on the stream, everybody. Just trying to digitally paint this real quick and then I can uh, get this print going again. <clears throat> Oops. Yeah. All right, are those all the surfaces I need? I'm pretty sure those are all the surfaces I need. All right, let's go slice that piece up. And it's still going to pack that full of support material in there. There's not a lot of room to get it out. It should be a lot less than was printed there before though. Hour and a half. All right, we'll go ahead and we'll see what layer height and stuff do I have on here? 0.15, give the support material slightly less. And then, I'm going to set a slight distance on these. All right, so I set up an <clears throat> hour and a half print, and it's going to go on the left one. All right, cool. There we go. Um, so yeah, Whip, what's uh, what's been going on in your world? You see, uh, didn't see anything in chat there, so. Let us clean up here. There we go. All right. Um, also did a joke, so let's read our dead joke for the day. Why did the NSA whistleblower spend the whole winter in Russia? He was snowed in. Snowden. Har har. All right. Um, cool. So again, feel free to uh, feel free to interrupt as I'm doing my stuff here. But uh, I want to spend some time working on a bit of a redesign of, uh, of what we're doing here. So I'm going to go in and kind of do like a bit of a reimagining of oops, of what I want to do for the site. Um, so right now I've got I've got those four sections on the site. Um, so at a, uh, 
top menu. Um, I still want to do. Still want to do the feedback. So I think it's important to give uh, credit for people that are doing like reviews and stuff like that. Um, and then got the resume reviews and live stream schedule. And then financial transparency. And then um, I'm going to call this one like audio podcast. And then speaking events. Daily email series. I'm probably going to bump up the priority of the daily email series though. Because um, one of the things I talked about last week on the, on the stream and, and on Sunday as well, uh, if you missed it, um, I'm going to be choosing occasional random people who are subscribed to the newsletter. Um, so I have to go in and write that code as well. Um, so that's something that's going to be, uh, I'm going to go add that to my to-do list actually. Where is my to-do list at? There it is. Uh, for coding. Um, I want to add a new card and that card is going to be, so if you do exclamation point to do, uh, you'll see a link of what I'm editing here. Um, so for code, we're going to, um, oh no, I've already got a, a card for that one. Never mind. Um, so write a card to pick a random subscriber from each newsletter for a giveaway. Um, there are also channel point redeems that you can do if you want to reprioritize something. If you're like, hey, I want to watch Ian do that, um, then uh, you're welcome to help reprioritize things. Um, so that one's not really blocked anymore. So that one's going to be in progress. So, so yeah, so I want to promote the daily newsletter a little bit more. On average, I have anywhere from 10 to 30 subscribers to that newsletter at any given time, and I would love that to be more. Um, you know, since I'm paying for the email delivery service and, and so on, I might as well uh, get some use out of it. So if, if you all can help promote that, um, I would appreciate it. If you've, if you've been a subscriber to the newsletter and you found any of it helpful, um, I would love it if you could let other people know about it and uh, tell them to subscribe and check it out. Um, let them know that there's going to be like random giveaways and stuff like that to subscribers. Um, I'm trying to think of like how often I want to do that. I can't do them all the time, obviously, but, uh, but I may try and do a giveaway like, you know, every other month or something like that. Um, so I haven't, I haven't totally decided on how frequently I want to do those giveaways, but, uh, but I know that I do want to do giveaways, uh, based on the newsletter, um, as well as the regular giveaway that we do on the stream itself. Um, and so like we did last year in the month of May and the month of October, uh, we were doing like the big, you know, giveaway thing, you know, lots of hype and lots of promotion around stuff I was giving away. Um, and lots of, you know, dragons or the kit cards that we did in October, lots of dragons back in May. Um, I still want to do things like that. Um, I do have a license now to sell things from, uh, Flexi Factory, and so I can print and sell anything from Flexi Factory as well as give it away. I don't need their permission to uh, to just give stuff away. Um, and so, probably most of the stuff that we're going to be printing and giving away for those giveaways will be Flexi Factory things. Um, so, if you have a favorite model, feel free to let me know, and I can certainly uh, certainly evaluate what we want to do as uh, as our giveaways. Um. So maybe we should have like a giveaway section of the website as well. So we'll, we'll plan for that. Um, otherwise, I want to plan out, um, I kind of want to plan out like this interview journey. And the idea that I had for this uh, kind of last summer was these are all the different sorts of steps in the interview process uh, for technical interviews, but also interviews at other kinds of jobs as well. And where are you in that journey? Where are you having problems on that journey? Um, one person that I'm mentoring right now, for example, they're applying for jobs and they're getting the initial HR calls. They'll occasionally get into a tech interview, uh, like the technical portion of the interview where they're writing some code or they're doing a take home. 
And they either get passed on after they do the take home or after the first technical interview, they kind of get, well, thanks, but we found someone else. Um, and they never get to the final stage and get an offer. And so what I told them is, okay, you need to practice technical mock interviews. Like that's where you're kind of falling off, like applying for the job, getting those first interviews, like you're doing that well. So obviously your resume is okay. If you're doing a cover letter, obviously that's okay. You're getting through the HR process, like that initial HR intake. And so whatever you're doing as far as like the behavioral stuff, you're generally getting through that okay. It's just on the technical side that you're struggling. And so that's where you need to practice. And so that's the kind of stuff that I want to sort of build out on the web page um, where we can kind of highlight those areas of the website and say, okay, well, what is the journey? Um, so we've got the preparation and this is going to be like resumes, cover letters, um, you know, project portfolio, um, but also company research. And then actual applying for the job and then the interviewing and then post interview. So this will be a little bit similar to the sections of the website that we've already got. Um, because we've already got these things kind of, kind of sort of, uh, put in place. Um, but applying, I kind of want to talk about like networking with people in here. Um, Let's see, customizing resume and cover letter. And then the actual interview. So we've got behavioral and we've got technical. Maybe we've got like take home assignments, take home projects, um, system design. Let's see what else, what other kinds of steps in a technical interview process would you think of? And then post interview, um, you know, getting feedback. And then negotiations, negotiations. Um, we'll loop that together with offers. So offers, and negotiations. Mm, what else? Hey, Code Core. Um, what am I discussing overall? Just the job hunting process. So I've, I currently have a website called techinterview.guide. It's on the TV here behind me. Uh, is the name of the website. And I'm, I want to go through and I want to reorganize the website. And as I'm reorganizing the website and, and taking the, the information that I've already got on there, I've also got a ton of stuff on my YouTube channel. Um, if you want to go check that out, I've got tons and tons of stuff on YouTube. And, and so I want to pull those YouTube videos into the website as well. So as they're reading through things, there's like a little blurb of me like, hey, this was during a live stream, but like here's, here's a little nugget about that particular topic. Um, so I'm kind of going through and I'm kind of reimagining like, how do I want to lay this out? Um, because what, I, what I've talked about in, in the past on the stream is um, like, depending on where you are in the, on your journey in the, in the tech interview, wherever you're falling off, like that's where you need help. And so how can I get that advice to you in a more succinct way? Like I'm having a problem with this part of the tech interview process. Well, here's some advice for that part of the tech interview process. Um, cause right now a lot of these interview sites, um, and, and interview guides and things like that, they're, they're just like, you know, here's a hundred things to do, go do all hundred things and you'll get the job, but they don't really spend a lot of time on if this is where you're getting stuck, this is what you need to examine. This is what you could work on. These are who you should be talking to. Um, like a lot of the sites don't go into that kind of detail. Um, so that's, that's mostly what I want to, uh, uh, try to stand out and differentiate a little bit. Um, is it open or is there a fee? It's totally free. Everything that I offer as far as my advice and my content is a hundred percent free. I don't charge any money for it. The only thing I do charge money for is resume reviews for people who already have jobs in the tech industry who have that disposable income. But if you need a resume review and you don't have disposable income, then you can send me your resume and I'll review it for free. So I've got one queued up and Sunday is basically our resume review day. So Sunday morning, I'll be doing uh, some resume reviews. So if you want to, uh, if you want a resume review, you're welcome to uh, submit that. Here's a link for it. Uh, my problem has been that I'm looking for remote work at night part time as I can't leave the army. Um, so that's not a total blocker. If you can factor in the time zone and say, this is when I'm going to be working. So if you know you're going to be working 
like uh, let's let's say let's say your Pacific time. Um, if you know that you can work six p.m. to midnight Pacific time, well, what time is that in Hawaii? Are there any companies in Hawaii that are looking for remote workers and say, hey, like my my hours are going to overlap your hours by this much, or look for something you know based in Asia or something like that where your time zone is going to be more in line with what they do. Um, so depending on what time of day you're able to work. Try to figure out what those time zone differences are and try to find companies in those time zones that are looking for remote workers. Um, I think you'll have an easier time getting their attention. But to contact an American company and say, hey, I'm also an American and I want to work for you, uh, assuming you're American. Um, but, you know, let's say if you live in America and you apply for an American job and say, I am American, but I can't work during the daytime. I only want to do this in the evenings. It is a little bit harder to convince them to hire somebody part-time. Most companies want somebody full-time and they want your full-time daytime effort, you know, to kind of overlap what their team is doing. So it's not impossible, but it will be much harder to get their attention. Um, if, if you let them know like, Hey, I'm not looking for a full-time job. I'm really just looking for part-time, you know, work of 20, 30 hours a week and not a 40 hour job. Um, you don't have to necessarily let them know that you're in the army, although it's probably going to be on your resume. Um, and if they ask like, why, why do you want this job? You know, you're already in the army, you know, how are you going to make that work? Um, that's also going to be a bit of a concern for, for companies. Cause what if you get deployed or what if you have something come up with your day job that suddenly you can't meet your deadlines for them? Um, that's going to be a little bit trickier. Um, also, if you're working part time, you're not going to be getting benefits from them anyway. It might actually be easier to go the freelance route and just look for a freelance job and just be like a contract programmer um, and, and set it up that way. And that way they don't even have to know when you work. You don't have to say, I'm promising you daytime hours. You can just say, I'm a freelance contract developer um, and, you know, interview with them, get the job. And then they don't have to know when you work. They just have to know that you're submitting your work and you're getting your stuff done on time. That's all they really need to know or care about and how to pay you. Um, but aside from that, you know, you can just say like, these are the hours that I worked for this week. This is when I intend to get this portion of this project done or that portion of that project done. Uh, might be a little bit easier to go a freelance route and actually set up a freelance business and convince a company that you're a freelance developer that you want to pick up some extra contract work on the side. That might be a little bit easier than trying to convince them uh, to hire you as a, as a part-time employee. Uh, yeah, I will share my resume. Cool. Yeah, you can send it in. I'll, I'll be happy to uh, do a free resume review for you um, on Sunday. Um, so yeah, go ahead and send that in. It'll ask if you want a private or a public review. Um, if you do want a private one, that's fine. I do charge for my time, but all that money goes into the diversity and tech fundraiser that I do. And then I also match that 50 bucks. So that 50 bucks isn't going into my pocket. It's going into a pot of money that helps increase diversity in the tech industry. And then I match all those funds. Um, so last year we gave away about $6,200, a little over 62, almost $6,300 last year. Actually, I think it was over $6,300 last year. Um, Cause we raised about 5,000, well, we raised $3,500 for the first organization. My employer kicked in. I thought they were going to kick in $1,500 because that's my calendar maximum. They actually kicked in uh, 1600 and change. Um, and so it actually went a little bit over that. And then they didn't match the one that we did at the end of the year, but we did almost $1,200 for that one. So yeah, it was, it was about $6,300 that we gave away to two different organizations to help increase uh, diversity in the tech industry. It's something I care a lot about. So, so yeah, just, just know that when you contribute, the money's not going into my pocket. It's helping other people out. Um, and if you do exclamation point money in the in chat, um, you'll see a website there where I detail all of that. I detail like this is how much money I make as a streamer. This is what I make on ad revenue. All that goes in and, and then uh, I donate all that money. Um, so yeah. So anyway, so what I'm working through tonight is just kind of the new high level, like this is what I want to kind of revamp the... Uh, the overall website. I'll make that a little larger so people can see it. Because um, we've kind of got these sections now, like introduction, which is you know a book intro on my background, which isn't as relevant. 
Like I can still do that as like an introduction section here. Uh, intro to me. And that's basically like, here's my background. Here's why I'm qualified to tell you all of this. Here's why I'm qualified to do interviews and things like that. Um, and then I might want to change the resume reviews, uh, like book my time, resume reviews, as well as mock interviews. Because that's something that I want to get into in 2023. And again, the money that I make from those mock interviews is also going into the diversity and tech fundraiser as well. Uh, live stream. Um, I'll put the live stream up here with a daily email. And financial transparency. I'm going to leave that more prominent audio podcast speaking events. Yeah, I think that's fine. Um, so yeah, so I wanted to kind of like, I, I had the idea last year of what if I made this like a flow chart kind of image where people can say like, okay, well, this here's the journey. Here's where I'm having a problem and then have this website sort of open at that point and say, okay, here's the advice that you need for, for that so that you don't have to look through all these sections and try to find what you're looking for just to make it really easy. Like this is where I'm having a problem. Boom. You go right to the advice for that. Um, and then, you know, there's obviously going to be all this other content that, that you can find, but having it, having a faster, easier way of sort of honing in on, you know, if this is where you're stuck, here's the advice to get unstuck for that area. Um, like if you apply for jobs and you never get a phone call, then it's something about your application. If you apply for that job and you don't pass the behavioral HR screen, then obviously that's where you need to practice. If you get through that, but you don't pass the technical side of it, or you, they don't like your take-home projects, then that's where you need to spend time. Um, so I kind of want to like break it out that way. And then, you know, once you, once you get to the end, if you get an offer, great. If you don't get an offer, how do you get feedback from them? What does it take to get feedback from a company? What kind of feedback do you ask for? How do you word those messages? Like I want to give examples that you can not quite copy and paste into an email, but you know, make it really compelling for them of like, hey, I want to get better. I want to reapply in three months or six months. You know, can you give me any kind of feedback that's going to help improve my chances? Because I really want to work for your company. Um, if you let them know that you're super passionate about what they do and who you are as a candidate, they're far more likely to give you that kind of feedback as well as asking them like, hey, can you give me like two or three things I did really well that really stood out like, wow, this person really impressed us with this or that. Um, I would appreciate it by giving you or by asking them for positive feedback because the companies generally don't want to give you negative feedback because they don't want to get sued. They don't want like any kind of problem there, but they're happy to give you positive feedback like, oh yeah, we really liked the projects that you had on your resume or we really liked this about your application or yeah, your answers, to the behavioral questions were some of the best that we've ever seen. Then you can kind of read between the lines and go, you know what? Nobody mentioned any of my take home project stuff. So maybe that's where I need to spend some time. Maybe I need to get a mentor that can code review what I'm building or help me look through, you know, the prompt of what it is I'm being asked to do. And, you know, am I missing certain things? Um, because without knowing that stuff, you're not going to get better. So anyway, so this is, this is kind of like a draft of like how I want to go through and reorganize this. And, and the content's already there. Like I've already got all this content on the website. It's just a question of like, how do I go in then and, uh, you know, break these, break these things down or move them around a little bit. Um, you know, instead of having like section one, section two, section three, section four, like just have just the content on there. Like here's the content. And when you get to this point in your journey, this is where you're stuck. Here's, here's the content that you need and make more like sort of tables of content, uh, you know, kind of along the way. Because right now when you pull up a whole section, it'll give you a, uh, a little bit of like a, you know, here are the sort of the sub pages. That's kind of what this, this children tag does is basically like go find all the children under me. In this case, it's chapter 10 and 11. And so it goes through and it like builds out a table of contents when you go to that page. So I want to have that on the site more. But like I said, right now, when you go visit techinterview.guide, there's like these bars on the left and right side to go from one page to the next. And that works okay on a desktop browser, but it looks horrible on a mobile de device. Um, there's no good way to go from one page to the next on a mobile device. It looks really awful. Um, so part of this redesign is also finding a better theme for the blog engine that I use. 
or the content management uh, editor that I used or, or uh, generator that I used that will allow people to navigate a little bit easier on the site. Um, you know, could I have a better navigation system? Certainly, that would, that would absolutely help. But I think, uh, I think reorganizing the information and being able to pull my YouTube videos in, I think would be a big help. The nice thing about this Hugo uh, static site generator that I use is you can come in here where you build out your theme and you can build out um, these little layouts. Um, but there's also, is it under here? Yeah, short codes. So I can go in here and I can build a short code. So this short code here for children is basically going to, like, as it generates this page, it actually goes and it pulls in this children.html file. And inside here, there's like, okay, well, here's all the configuration stuff that you need to know. And then go build an unordered list. Go find my page. Go find the set of pages under me. Is that like a home page or does it have subsequent sections? And it's basically kind of a meta programming language of how do I go build kind of a directory of all these other pages in an unordered list. And then it, it's kind of building these, these links of like, go to the next page, go to the previous page. And this is the stuff that I want to rip out of here. Um, but yeah, this is basically where it's going through. And it's, and it's, building up the, uh, it's building up all the HTML links so that SEO is taken care of and, and stuff like that. So I can keep these short codes. Like that, that doesn't need to break uh, or change. But I do want to change the overall theme that I'm using. This Hugo theme learn is a is a pretty good theme for doing like a book sort of resource where you want to go page to page chapter to chapter but when i look at the analytics of the website nobody goes to my website and reads the whole thing you know page to page to page to chapter to chapter nobody reads it that way they are looking for something specific google or whatever will send them to a particular page they might read a couple of other pages and then they leave and so i I want to get rid of the, the navigation that's built into the theme a little bit. So, hey, maybe see, good to see you as well. Thanks for the hydrate. Uh, it has been a while. The dragon you made is still happy as a lark. I decided on switching careers from research to data analyst. Awesome. Probably going to be asking for your help soon. Absolutely. Um, send in a resume anytime. Uh, I'm going to be doing resume reviews on Sundays now. Um, you know, kind of on an ongoing basis. Sunday is going to be more of the interview prep career advancement. Uh, kind of streams where the Thursday night is going to be more like, you know, the 3D printing stuff that I'm doing or coding or something like that. In this case, I'm going to be rebuilding out the uh, the tech interview guide website. Um, you know, maybe programming more about the lights behind me. I I built the little pew pew command for the uh, for the trench run back here. So if you do exclamation point pew pew, you'll see the you'll see the lights on that blink. And I got a light kit as well uh, right here which is the light kit for the BD-1 droid over here. There it goes. Um, so that was, that was a lot of fun to, uh, to build on the stream. Um, I know it's kind of far away. So I also, if, if I can find some good USB extension cords, I actually want to put a camera next to those things that when you do a pew pew command or once we get the BD-1 set up, that when you do either of those commands, that it'll activate a camera over there and like turn on a camera source um so that you can like you'll see you know a little window like the printer up here above like you'll see a little thing pop up and you'll actually see it blink uh a little bit better because right now it's really far away so i want to i want to see if i can i've got some U usb extension cords i just have to get them traced over to that other workbench behind me um uh, but set set it up in a way that you know they you can uh, you can see the lego kits on there um, so yeah, all kinds of fun stuff that I want to do. So we did the, uh, we did the trench run last Thursday. Um, uh, tonight we're doing a little bit of coding. Um, but yeah, I'll be doing, I'll be doing another one of those light kits. I've got a ton of Lego sets as well. Um, and I'm waiting for more light kits to come in. So I bought, uh, an X-Wing fighter and I've got a light kit coming in for that. Um, I think that's the only other light kit that I have, but I've got like, what, a dozen or so. If you pull up the to-do list. I've got just a ton of stuff on here and this is this isn't all like 2023 goals but i've got almost 20 different lego kits to put together so it's gonna it's gonna take a minute um not to say i'm gonna be like a full-time like lego streamer or anything like uh like other folks here on twitch but 
it is fun. You know, sometimes I'll, you know, in the evening, I'll put on someone else's uh, Twitch channel or when we raid out tonight, I'll probably pull out a Lego kit and just start assembling Lego while I'm watching someone else's stream. Um, but for some of these things where I can maybe add a little motor to it or add some LED lights to it or something like that, I think it'd be fun. Um, and then offline, I've got like a bunch of offline work that I want to do uh, around like getting more cameras in the 3D printers. And uh, I'm setting up the fifth, no wait, one, two, three, four, five, sixth printer uh, this weekend, getting the Voron finished up on Sunday with a couple of guys. Uh, they're gonna help me finish up the Voron. And then I can start printing really big stuff. That one's gonna be 350 by 350 by 350, um, which is what, 14 inches, 15 inches, something like that. Wait, 350, 30 is 12 inches. That's another 50 millimeters, which is another two inches. So it'll be, yeah, it'll be 14 inches cubed. So uh, the thought there is I can get into printing much larger things like cosplay armor and show you how I'm going to go in and finish those things uh, with post-processing and sanding and filling in cracks and sanding that stuff and then getting into painting and stuff like that. So my whole workbench over here is small. <laughs> I've got some paints and stuff set up. Um, but I'm going to be building a whole new workbench, another workbench. So I'll have three workbenches down here. I got one right behind me. Got one over here for the printers. I'm going to build another one on the other side of my desk over here. Um, and that one's going to be more of the painting uh, sort of station. Um, I bought a little $50 airbrush set as well. Um, so that's going to be coming in, I think, next week. Um, and so I want to get into like just really simple airbrushing sort of techniques and learn how to airbrush, you know, stuff like that. I think it'd be fun. Um, I've never airbrushed before. I've, I've always only ever painted things by hand or spray paint can. Um, but I think the airbrush will be, uh, will be a really nice touch for, you know, getting into cosplay armor and stuff like that. Um, and then I'm going to be, I'm also going to be rebuilding a website that I initially started for my kids to sell 3d printed stuff. Um, and I'm going to be kind of taking that over and actually doing that more as a business. So if people want to buy 3d prints, then they'll have like a little shop. And then part of building out that shop is that when we do a giveaway, you'll be able to go to the website and say, this is what I want as my prize. And you'll have a code like a, like a one-time use code or something that will give you hundred percent off the cost and shipping of that item. Um, so that I'll, I'll print it for you and you can go in and choose colors of, of filament and things like that. So it's going to be, uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. You want to print a magneto helmet that would be great stuck on one piece prints my bed footprints small that was part of why i wanted to build the bigger printer for sure um is is being able to not not specifically for the helmets but just to get into larger items and larger pieces and things like that um you know i over the last year or two i've seen a lot of people 3d print the iron man helmet with the motors in it that they they like act you know they push their jaw in a particular way or they have like a little you know hand activated thing and it like opens the mask you know i want to i want to get in and do some of that kind of stuff i think it'd be fun although the i don't know if any of you saw the uh, the video recently of the guy that actually built the heads up display inside the iron man helmet he found these these small like super high quality uh lcd panels and he actually put them behind lenses uh, and then put cameras through the eyes of the actual helmet. So as he's walking around with the Iron Man helmet on, he can actually see what's happening on the outside. It was only like a 20 millisecond lag. So it was pretty much real time. And uh, he actually got like a little mini heads up display happening inside the actual Iron Man helmet. It was pretty incredible to watch. Um, I don't want to get anywhere near that deep because it took him like two years to design and build all that stuff. I don't want to go that deep. Um, but uh, but I'm going to be getting into more sorts of like engineering things like I was talking about. Um, you know, I've got I've got all these stream deck uh, things now and I, I want to like join these extrusions together on this 30 degree angle so that I can like put the stream decks in front of me on the desk and, uh, you know, not tip over um, because they're they're kind of heavy. So that's why I wanted the uh, the shorter piece of extrusion to kind of cap on the end to give it some stability. So I may not do it right in the middle. I might do it back a little bit more like this so that the longer edge is pointed back a little bit just to give it a little more stability i don't even know if i need that whole extrusion i could probably just print a little leg that just you know fits on here and just gives a little bit of stability on the back or something um but that way i'll have all of the stream deck uh things uh 
you know, right in front of me and, and, but also angled a little bit. I had 3D, I had custom 3D printed uh, when I had just the two uh, stream decks. I custom 3D printed this with the tech interview guide, uh, you know, as a faceplate. And that worked out great. But now that I've got a third stream deck, this isn't as feasible anymore. Um, and, and trying to print something, uh, even with the Voron, uh, it's going to be too wide to try to print something that will actually be a faceplate over all three of these things. Um, plus trying to figure out like how to offset them and things like that is going to be a little tricky. So, so that's going to be, uh, that's going to be some of the stuff that I'm going to be doing on Thursdays is getting into that 3d design and, and show you the kinds of stuff that I'm building and tinkering with and working on the electronic side of things, um, and coding up like little internet of things like a pew pew command and, and stuff like that. That's going to be more of the Thursday stream. Sunday is going to be all interview prep, like nothing but interview prep. We'll have topics, um, whether I plan out those topics ahead of time yet, I don't really know. But uh, but the idea is that Sunday is going to be just interview prepping. I'm dropping stuff all over the place here. And then, uh, you know, in resume reviews. And if I have a guest on the stream, that'll be, that'll be on Sundays as well. Um, another thing that I started building for the miniature painting, this is a, another design I came up with. Um, there, there are people out there that have these... Uh, that have these handles that they put uh, a miniature on top of, and then they they paint the miniature. Um, and and generally the top of it would be would be something kind of smooth, where they use like a blue tack or some sort of sticky material on the top, and then they attach the model to that. So, for example, if I had uh, you know one of these little astronauts, and I wanted to paint this, and I want to be able to paint the base, and I want this to be able to stick on here and be able to get in and paint the base. And so I wanted a handle that I could hang on to, you know, where I can get in and I can paint all the, all the details. And so if you ever watch anybody do any kind of airbrushing or miniatures painting here on Twitch, you'll see them with some kind of handle. And so I, I went through and I thought, well, I want to design something where I can take the top of this off and, and set it down. And so I thought, well, what if I used magnets on here to hold the top on? And so I did. So I made something where it's got magnets on the on the lid and the base, and it's not going to fall off. And I wanted to design it in a way that I could actually spin it. Um, and and this version of it doesn't spin very well, because uh, what I want to do is I want to I, I wanted to change this top hole to actually be a pin. Um, so it had a pin to actually spin on. Because right now, when you when you try to when you try to turn this with your thumb, it kind of like it rocks off the whole thing. But the idea with, with the design is the polarity of the magnets will help hold this in place. Um, but I wanted something where I could just spin it with my thumb, like while I'm painting, that I could just spin it with my thumb. And then I thought, well, I could just turn the handle in my hand. Like, how lazy am I that I don't even want to do this? I just want to, like, flick my thumb and, like, spin the thing around. But, you know, that kind of stuff is, is fun to design. It's not super practical. It's not a lot of use. I put it on printables. I doubt anyone ever is going to download it and print it. But that's fine. Um, but that's the kind of stuff that I want to do, uh, you know, on Thursdays or maybe, you know, I talked about streaming on Tuesdays. This Tuesday was busy though, so I wasn't able to stream. Um, but, uh, but I want to, I want to start streaming that kind of stuff because that stuff is fun to me and it's interesting to me and I'm working on this stuff anyway. I might as well stream and like have conversation with people and show other people what I build and how I do what I do. Uh, you know, whether it's practical for anybody else to build a little miniature painting handle like that. I mean, there's already dozens of models out there for, you know, that other people have already made, but I want something that was mine. So what does it take to go build a handle like that? How do I, how do I get this little grippy, you know, sort of side on it? How do I make something that's sturdy enough that it's going to sit as a base? You know, how do I, how do I think about those kinds of designs? How do I put something in my hand and go, yeah, that's going to be comfortable. Or like, oh, you know what? The angle of this is going to kind of drive me bonkers. Like maybe I don't need that, but I wanted something that would kind of lock into the, the crook of my hand a little bit, you know, or the heel of my hand a little bit while I'm holding this thing to, to paint. Um, and so that's why I designed it the way that I did. Um, and so for me, it's going to be practical. Once I reprint it and get that pin in there, instead, it'll be, uh, it'll be a good practical little print. Um, unfortunately, I've already glued all of the magnets on the lid here. And initially I thought, well, I'm just going to load this thing up with a ton of magnets. And then I realized these, these like rare earth magnets are crazy strong. I probably need to put the magnets all around the base and just put one magnet on the top. I don't need 
you know, eight or nine of them on the top. I only need one on the top that needs to line up with one of these on the base so that, it, you know, as you're spinning, it locks at that next magnet. Um, because putting them all on there, like it's actually takes a little bit of force to, to spin that thing around, but it does spin. Like if I use two fingers, I can spin and realign it right away. And that works, but it's not going to be very practical to do that while I'm painting. Um, so I, I need to go back and redesign that a little bit. But, you know, that kind of stuff is fun. You know, tinkering with that kind of stuff on weekends is, is kind of fun for me. So anyway, um, so yeah, so as I look for a new theme for the website, like I said, I can keep these short codes and I, I want to basically develop a short code in here for YouTube um, where it's going to go generate everything that I need for YouTube or go fetch something from, uh, from Airtable about the details of YouTube or, you know, as it's, as it's going through and building out the site, if I can have some kind of code in here as well, because uh, the Hugo static site generator is written in Go. And there, there, there are some ways that in this short code that you can actually write little snippets of code to actually go do things. And I want to be able to actually use the YouTube API to say like, hey, if, I, if I'm calling this YouTube object, go to YouTube and go fetch the name and the description and then, you know, all that kind of stuff and so that I can actually embed that as part of the web page as it's going through and like generating the static content on the site. Um, but if I've got a lot of videos, Google tends to rate limit their APIs uh, pretty heavily because they don't want them abused. Um, and so I'm going to need some way of hitting their API, fetching that data and like maybe put it in Airtable and then hitting Airtable to get that information. If I don't have it in Airtable, then go to YouTube and get it and then put it back into Airtable for next time. Uh, kind of like a caching layer. Um, just that way I'm not, you know, going to crush my uh, YouTube API quota every time I try to rebuild the website. Because I also want to rebuild the website on a more regular basis. Um, like I want that to be automated. So if I plan for a guest on the stream, I can just put that stuff in Airtable and I know that overnight the site's going to regenerate and it's going to build that schedule page. I don't have to go in and manually add them because right now, if, if I want to have somebody on the site, I've got to go in to, that's the money one. Close off some of these resume review. There's the streaming. So this is where I have the, uh, the schedule. You know, but now I've got to come in here and I've got to go in and I've got to like manually remove these things and then republish the website. And so it's, it's still like, it's not much work, like go in and delete a couple of lines or if I have a guest on the stream and later on I can like add them to the, you know, here's who I've recently had on the stream. You know, I used to go in and like manually put in links like, oh, here's, you know, finite singularity on Twitch you know, here's how to contact them or here's, you know, this person's LinkedIn account or whatever. And then I started getting lazy going, yeah, Ryan's got a LinkedIn account, you know, but I didn't even bother linking it. I just put the link next to it. Um, I would love to grab this stuff out of Airtable and just build the schedule page on its own. So that's the kind of stuff that I want to like show you how I code that stuff on Tuesdays and Thursdays, you know, as a senior dev. And then if you've got questions about how I do, do that kind of thing or build that kind of thing, you know, you can always ask on the, uh, on the stream. Um, but when I'm coding or when I'm 3D printing or when I'm painting, I absolutely want people to know that you can always interrupt me and ask questions at any time. You don't have to, don't have to wait for me to take a break to go, oh, by the way, I've, you know, can you review my resume? Or, oh, by the way, I've got this question about this part of the interview process. Like, you don't have to wait for that kind of stuff. Um, you can just ask questions anytime. I mean, that's, that's the whole reason I started the stream was to help people out with interview prep and career prep. And I'm not giving up on that. Um, I know it's going to be a lot harder in 2023 to get a tech job. I, I get that. Um, and so I'm not, I'm not giving up on it just because it's hard, but I do want to focus my energy a little bit. Um, and also find time for the kinds of things that I want to do and make time for more creativity just to exercise that part of my brain a little bit more because that's, it's something that I miss doing. I miss painting. I miss doing creative stuff. So, anyway. Uh, so back to the planning over here. So um, i trying to think of like what other sort of sections or subsections I'm going to need on this. What happened to our subscription? 
Oh, that was just planning out like Stripe has like a subscription thing that you can plan now. Uh, speaking events. And then again, if I do a speaking event, I want to I want to have it like automatically populate this page. I don't want to come in and manually add this stuff every time I give a talk to somebody. So like I, I want to be able to just put it in Airtable and know it's going to show up on my website at some point. Yeah, how's everybody else doing? How's uh, how's everybody's week been? Um, I had someone ask the other day, it's like, oh, if you're going to do more 3D printing, are you going to do like Polymaker giveaways and things like that? I'm not sponsored by anyone like that. Um, I've thought about, you know, asking about getting like to be a sponsor, but um, because I'm not 3D printing like 100% of the time and I'm not really, not really planning on giving out advice on 3d printing like i'll show the things that i do and i'll show the design work that i do i don't know whether that's going to warrant someone like polymaker or anybody to like give me a sponsorship so i'm not i'm not aiming for it if they approach me and say like hey do you want a sponsorship then i might say yes to give stuff away because people tend to come by for giveaways for sure um so yeah we'll see uh hey whoa dude Life has put my back against the wall. I'd love to reach out and leverage your advice. I don't want to put my business out there. I will say I feel so defeated. Not sure I have what it takes anymore. Absolutely reach out. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, you can you can absolutely reach out to me. I'm happy to chat offline. You don't have to bring it up uh, live on Twitch. Happy to have that conversation offline and uh, try to help you out if I can. So yeah, absolutely reach out to me, please. Happy to help out. Um, it's, it's, it's a real struggle, especially for people trying to find that first job in tech. Like this one person that I'm mentoring, they've been looking for a job for over a year and it's been really hard on the, actually it's been close to a year and a half. They, uh, they finished a coding program and they took some time off to kind of like get their bearings because, you know, it was a really intense, uh, kind of program that they did. And then, you know, their GitHub kind of suffered. So like looking at their GitHub uh, profile, you know, they had lots and lots of gaps on there for really long periods of time. And I'm like, well, what were you doing with that time? Like employers are going to want to know that you're not just sitting back and like watching TV and playing video games. And their answer was like, well, I'm working on take home projects and I'm working on, you know, trying to keep my skills sharp and I'm trying to learn new things and whatever. And I'm like, well, then put that stuff on GitHub. You know, if you're building that stuff, put it on GitHub so that people can see that you're still actively developing. Um, but it took some convincing to, to get them to do that. Um, but they're still at the point where, you know, like having, having that sort of flow chart of like, this is where I'm getting stuck. This is where I need, you know, and then, and then offering like, this is, this is the help I can provide. Trying to get that on a web page where you don't have to wait for me to be streaming, for me to hop into chat and go, Hey, can I like book your time and schedule some time and have a chat with you? Um, that you can go try to find a little bit of help on the website. And then if I'm able to help, absolutely, I'm going to help. Um, you know, if you, if you don't find what you're looking for on the webpage, I totally want people to reach out to me and say like, hey, I couldn't find, you know, anything about this or, you know, this part of the website kind of helped, but I've still got a question about this or that. I absolutely want to try to help people if I can. I don't have all the answers. But I've been in the tech industry a long time. Like I've been doing this. It's going to be 27 years in April that I've been in the in the industry, and it sounds ridiculous to even say that number. But I've been doing this for a while. I've been in management. I've been a director of engineering. I've had those kinds of roles. This is what qualifies me to be able to give you advice. That you know, hey, when we ask this kind of question in an interview, this is what we're really asking. This is really what we want to know. Um, you know, that's why I love helping people out with, with this stream because I've got that kind of background and I can help people kind of peek behind the curtain a little bit and see what goes on in the tech industry and why we ask the questions that we do and how we evaluate candidates and, and things like that. So that, that was the whole purpose of putting the stream together. So I'm absolutely happy to help people out. At the same time, I've got, <laughs> I've got a mentor of mine in, in, my back, in the back of my mind uh, hearing his voice in my head when I was working at SendGrid, one of the founders, uh, I was answering directly to one of the founders at one point. I was working on R and D projects. I was leading a team and I was working on a little side thing for, for sales and, and, uh, um, account management teams. 
And I'm like, I don't even feel like I'm splitting my time like one third. It feels like I'm splitting my time like 10%, 10%, 10%. And the rest of it is just context switching of like, well, I've got to go to this meeting and take care of these people. Now I've got to go to that meeting and work on some code, you know, with those people. And the advice he gave me was humans are not scalable. So while I love giving out this advice, there is going to be a point where if I do get busy with it, I'm not going to be as available as I want to be. And that was part of the whole reason of putting a live stream together, putting this content together on a web page that I can go in and manipulate and add content at any time. Having the email series in the newsletters where people can go subscribe to the newsletter and and find some of that stuff hey, on their own. Thanks for being the good um, person. Smile. Hey, G. Who's Jay? Thanks for dropping by, man. Appreciate it. Miss uh, Miss our Friday night gaming. I'm looking forward to getting back into that on uh, on this week. Hope. Uh, Hope your new year's going okay uh, at, the, at the Fang Company. Um, I know things have been a little rocky even at Fang Companies these days. But, um, but I, was, I was a software teacher for four years. And teaching a class of 30 to 60 students at a time was great. But I wanted to go bigger than that. And that was why I got into live streaming. So that I can reach a bigger audience. I can reach more people. I'm putting the videos on YouTube. And I'm, I'm like this close to 1,000 subscribers on YouTube which will unlock like other features and advertising and things like that, which will go back in and, and help with the diversity and tech fundraiser and so on. Um, so it, it, all, it all comes down to me wanting to help people, but doing it in a way that's scalable, where I can help people if I can. And if I haven't got the capacity to, that I've still got that content somewhere that you can go see it. You know, whether it's a previous stream or a blog post or something on techinterview.guide as a website. Um, and so part of, part of this redesign of the website is, is partly to kind of bring the design of it a little bit more modern, um, but also to be geared more to this is where I am in my journey and this is where I need help. And then that way, the conversations that I have with people like, whoa, dude, like you want to, you want to have a conversation that that conversation can be more, more of the empathy side of it where I can be more of a listening ear than just spouting off advice and going into, you know, fix it advice mode. Because I know that that's not always what people want or need when they're asking for help. Sometimes they just want someone to listen to what happened. Um, so I, I want to be available for those kinds of conversations more for the in-person stuff than, hey, Ian, can I get your thought about this job? Or can I get your thoughts about this particular company research or something? Like, I'm happy to do that too, but I think some of that um, I'm happy to do on stream as well. So uh, I was looking back through chat here. I'm sure we'll have a session eventually. Yeah. Well, I'm glad we get to level up again. So every time our, our game master cancels, so he canceled this coming Friday, he canceled tomorrow night. Every time he cancels on us, like if, if, if a bunch of us can't make it, then he's just like, all right, well, then we're just not, not going to meet. But if something comes up from him where he's like, hey, I can't do it, Friday night, he lets us gain a whole new level. Um, and, and if you know anything about tabletop gaming, we generally only go to 20 levels. And I think I'm going to be level 12 now. Um, I think I've gained more levels from him canceling than I've actually gained levels playing uh, this adventure. Um, but it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, I'm looking forward to Friday. Well, next Friday, I guess, not, not tomorrow. So, um. Looking at code core, if my day to day work is on a closed repo, how do I account for that or do I discuss that in person? So, um, in GitHub, you can actually go in and tell GitHub that you want private repos to show up on your contribution graph. You don't have to make the repo public because that would be a huge security concern for companies that people would even see, you know, the name of the repo, much less, you know, your actual commits and things like that. And so you can go into a setting in GitHub and you can say, make all of my private repo contributions available on my graph. And all people see is that you made 14 commits today, but they don't see what the name of the repo was. All they can see is that this happened on a private repo. So for example, if you go to my GitHub account, it's github.com slash Ian Douglas, not 736, just Ian Douglas. Um, you'll see that I contribute to a repo a couple of times a day where I'm going in and I'm checking off some things and I'm, you know, gradually getting some work done on some little side projects and whatever. And I commit that code a couple of times every day. But when you go look at my GitHub repo, all you see is that I made a couple of commits to a private repo. 
you don't see what the repo was. So you don't know whether it was something I committed for work or if it was my side project. All you see is that I've committed to a private repo and it still shows like a much darker green sort of contribution because I'm writing code almost every single day. If I'm not writing code, I'm writing documentation and I'm writing things that I'm still committing into repos every single day. Um, they're not even on the internet and can't be. Okay. So if they're not even on the internet, that makes it a lot harder. There are things that you can do. I mean, depending on your, your software skill, there are some things that you could do there where, for example, you could make a private repo on your account and you could build some automation for yourself. You can build like a little GitHub automation within your own system. So if you, if you use something like Git, but even if you don't use Git, if you use some other thing where you can go get a history of like, I made five commits today, I made eight commits yesterday, um, you could automate something where you're just like touching a file, you're adding a single character to a file and making a GitHub commit to your own private repo for every commit that you make on your work repo or repos, plural. So if you've got three different repos and you're making lots of commits throughout the day, you can have something, you know, you'd have to write this stuff yourself. This stuff isn't going to already exist. But say, okay, go look at the history of that repo. Go look at the history of that repo. Go see how many commits I made on those repos. And then go loop through for each one of those numbers, go through and make like a little commit on my private GitHub repo and go push that up to GitHub. So anybody, you know, if, if anybody were to go look at that repo, it would just be full of garbage, but your contribution graph will stay dark because it'll show that you're actually contributing, but it's going to be to a private repo. And if someone says like, hey, can you tell me what you were working on? You can say it was actually a work repository. I can't show you the work. I can't talk about even what the repos were because it wasn't online anywhere. Um, but I was able to loop it into my GitHub. And you can talk about the automation. Say, I wanted to be able to show that contribution graph. And so here's a script that I wrote that shows how I pull that log data to see all the commits that I made or the work that I did. And I make a single commit to this private repo just so they mirror each other. The nice thing about that is you can actually, if you can pull up log data of how you committed to the other repo, whether it's mercurial or subversion or if it's some flavor of git or whatever if you can get a, a log history you can go back in time and you can also uh, do that inside of github as well so you can also you can kind of cheat github a little bit with this where you can say pretend i made these eight commits today but pretend i made these five commits yesterday and you can actually go in and manipulate the history so that when you push that to github it'll actually backfill a lot of that stuff for you. It doesn't just start today when you implement that script. It'll actually go through, you know, if you can, if you can go through and get a historical uh, sort of review of, of the work that you've done on, on, uh, on those repos, you could kind of cheat the Git history a little bit and write the stuff in the past as well. Um, there, there are ways around it. It's, uh, it's a bit of a hack, but, uh, but it's, a, it's a clever way around it. So there, someone actually wrote a script years ago that would go into your GitHub profile and basically make a private repo and make a ton of commits by cheating the date like this so that when you look at the contribution graph, it actually spelled out a word or words on the contribution graph like hire me or you know looking for work or like however you could you know, however many words you could actually fit in on the one year graph. Someone wrote a script that would actually go in and manipulate all the dates of when those commits happened and, and how many commits happened. So even if you had like a smattering of commits, it would make them like super dark green. And so it would spell out these words um, and, and, and do that. So go, go find that script and go figure out how they manipulate the date in Git and then go see if you can grab the history of what it was you've built in the past and go do something similar to what that script did where it's writing commits into a into a private repo like that. Um, and then just have, have that, you know, check in every so often. Um, you'll need to keep track of like, I've already processed this date in the past. So it doesn't like add more and more contributions, you know, over time that it's not constantly going all the way back to day zero or anything like that. Um, but like anytime, like 
if you, if it was something that runs on every Sunday, you can say, okay, well, since last Sunday, like only go back to last Sunday. Don't go farther than that because you don't want you don't want to recommit those things. That would be one way to sort of cheat it. Would not need to have access to the internet under those guidelines. Yes and no. Um, depending on security practices at your company, it sounds like they're super secure because they're doing all this stuff offline anyway. But if there's any way that you could just write it into a localized Git repo and then copy that GitHub repo onto like a USB flash drive or something like that and take it home, plug that in and, and do that. Um, but that might also make them nervous of why are you like copying stuff off, you know, onto a secondary device. But um, I can't cover all your bases, but that would be the kind of thing that I would do if I had to, because I've, I've had people on the stream ask in the past, like I have a work account and I also have a personal account on GitHub. And so if I, if I do a bunch of work on my work account, how do I make that reflect on my personal account? And I say, well, you can't really, because they would have to add your private account to those repos so that they can, you know, see that contribution graph. But you could do something similar to what I just described, where every time you make a commit on your other account, you can make a commit on your, on your uh, personal account that mimics, hey, I just made a commit to my work account, go make a commit on a private repo on my private account, on my personal account. And so the contribution graphs would end up looking the same over time. Um, I can't plug a thumb drive in, um, but I have a way to go about look at it now. I don't know if that could be solved. I mean, yeah, I mean, if it can't be solved for the past stuff, at least going forward, you'd, you'd have something to, to think about. Um, but you could also talk to your boss and be like, hey, like, I'm, I'm putting in a lot of work and a lot of effort here. I want to be able to show that contribution if I ever decide to change my job. You don't want to make them nervous by having that conversation and make them think you're going to leave your job. But you want to be able, you want to, be able to sort of walk away from this job at some point and say, here's everything that I did or here's a quantifiable view of like what it was that I did other than putting some very vague things on a resume if you can't even talk about it publicly. How are you going to put that on a resume? Like it's going to be really hard for you to make a resume for your next job if you can't even talk about the stuff now. Um, aside from like, oh yeah, I was a software developer there for five years, but I can't talk anything about what I did. Now, if it's like secret clearance or something like that, then yeah, obviously you can't talk about it, but you can still talk in very high level vague terms of, I worked on a team of this many people and we had strong collaboration and we were able to increase productivity by 20% without going into detail on what it was you actually did. But in an interview, they're going to want to hear what that impact was. Like I talk a lot about on the stream about like when you build out a resume, you want to show the impact that you had, not just explain, I did this, I did this, I did this. You want to be able to say, I did this and it made this better. And I did this and it made this faster. And I did this and it, you know, generated more revenue. Like you want to be able to talk about that stuff on a resume. And that's hard to do when the work that you're doing is private and you can't even talk about the work. So I, I empathize with where you're coming from. Um, hopefully it'll, hopefully it'll give you some ideas of, of things that you can do though. Um, Robo Oso, good to see you as well. Hope you're doing really well. Juggling biohazards, good to see you as well. Um, have I ever gone through burnout? I certainly have, yes. Been on a long no code streak. Really got to get projects for work. Feels like Mount Everest. I've been there. Absolutely, I've been there. Um, there was a point where I almost walked away from tech completely. It was uh, late 2010. So in late 2010, I had a job from 2008 to 2009. It was the end of 2009 that I, that I burned out. Um, so my wife was pregnant, um, and I had started a new job. So I started that job in February of 2008, found out my wife was pregnant and, uh, and he was born, our oldest son was born that October. And like the day after he was born, I got called to pull an all nighter at work, even though I'd planned for parental leave. Um, they had me train somebody else, but my engineering manager didn't trust the person that I trained. Um, and I just, I got super burned out. And the, the following whole year, like the first year of my kid's life, I missed most of that year because I was working so much all the time, like literally 90 hour work weeks all the time. And by that 
next fall, like our son had turned one and I was like, I was burning out. I was barely sleeping. I was eating crap all the time. I was drinking heavily. I was just not enjoying life. And I'm like, I need to take a break. And so I, I talked to my engineering manager. It got, it got to, a, it got to a, uh, a point where I was not speaking respectfully to my boss and why I didn't get fired is beyond me. Uh, thank you for the follows, by the way. Um, it was beyond me, like why they didn't just fire me because of the way that I was like acting to my, to my engineering manager. I'm like, dude, I'm burned out. I can't do this. I'm the only person on this thing. I've been asking you for a year and a half to have other people on the team. I brought up the whole paternity leave thing. I'm like, I'm taking two weeks off and I'm going to take it as, as paid time off, but it is not coming out of my PTO. The company owes me this much. I've put in so much extra time and so much overtime that I've not been paid for. I've not been reimbursed. I haven't been given the help that I've been begging you for. So I'm taking two weeks off on your dime and it's not going to count as PTO. And my boss basically came back and said, well, we'll just tell people that you're working from home for a couple of weeks. I'm like, no, you tell them I'm on vacation because I don't want them bugging me. I need it like unplug go offline. I'm not going to be paying attention to email. I'm going to leave my work cell phone here because they also had me carry a work cell phone so I could be paged at any time. I'm like, I'm leaving that work cell phone here. Like I'm literally walking away for two weeks. I don't want any contact. And they're like, well, we need to come up with some kind of narrative. I'm like, tell people that I'm frigging burned out and I can't work. And they're like, well, no, we can't tell them that. That's too, it's too negative, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm taking this time off. Well, I, that was on a, so I, I wrapped everything up by that Friday, Monday, I, I took that day off. Tuesday, I took that day off. By Wednesday, I'm like, I don't want to go back to this job. Like it, it literally only took me two days of decompression where I didn't have to go to work, where I realized I actually really hate this job. And so I went in on that Wednesday and I'm like, here's my notice. And they're like, well, aren't you taking two weeks off anyway? I'm like, yep. So I'm going to play that out. And then I'm going to just come in for that like one last week, wrap everything up, and then I'm done. I'm out. I'm, and I walked away. And I was so burned out. I'm like, I'm leaving tech. Like, I can't even do this anymore. I can't write code. Um, and you know, I, I joked with a lot of people at, at the time. I'm like, if I'm, if I'm burning out this hard, and I'm dealing with crap all day. I might as well just go become a plumber if I'm just going to deal with crap all day. I was a little more colorful with my language back then. But if I got to deal with this crap all day, every day, I might as well go be a plumber. And uh, I, was, I was seriously looking at careers outside of tech because I was so burned out and I, I wasn't enjoying anything. Like I couldn't even go home and enjoy video gaming. Like I was just, I was burned out. I would go home and I would collapse into bed. And I would fall asleep. Or, you know, try to have some family time because I had an infinite home. And uh, yeah, it was, it was not a good time in, in my life. Hey, writer, good to see you. Um, this wasn't infrastructure work. I was, I was like a core individual, like it was, it was an ad tech company. And so we, we as a company were, uh, we had a platform where other people could come to us and say, I want to put a tag on my website. And you're just going to play ads on that tag and I get a share of that revenue. Um, and it was wildly successful. Like the business grew like crazy. Um, but what, one of the things that we had to keep track of in, in our analytics was how many times have we shown a particular ad? Like if I show an ad for a hockey game, um, the person selling that ad would say, you can only show this to 50,000 people on the internet and then I want that ad taken offline. Like they didn't just want to pay for it perpetually. And so this website would show up and this website would show up. And so we'd have to keep track of like, okay, well, that hockey ad showed over here. And now we're going to show it over here. And now we're going to show it over here. But once we get to that 50,000, we have to stop showing that ad. And so we had to know over time, like as we're showing all these ads, we had to know how many times have we shown this ad? What sites have we put it on? What kind of demographics have seen this ad? And so we were collecting all this data about the website and who we thought the user was. And we we're trying to build up user profiles about you know, do we know anything about this person? This was like 2008, 2009. So it was still really early stages of trying to figure out who a user was. And, um, and like, it was, it was deeply interesting, 
problem to try to solve. Like, how do we collect all of this information, lapse it down and aggregate it in a way that, you know, as I'm taking in all of this log data, I have to process all this log data and get it back into a database in near real time so that the code that's figuring out, okay, well, should I show this hockey ad again or not, knew whether it was allowed to show that ad anymore or not. Now, there was a little bit of tolerance. We would tell people like, hey, 50,000, okay, it might go a little bit over. Like we, got, we need some wiggle room of like 5% or something like that. Like there was a margin of error and advertisers were okay with a small margin of error. But like if they said 50,000, we couldn't show it 100,000 times. Like if we showed it 60,000, it was no big deal. Um, so there was always some margin of error that they would allow for. Um, but we had to keep that margin of error as small as possible. And so I had to be able to process all this data as fast as possible and get it back in the database. Well, I was one guy building all of that. Like, how do I take in gigabytes of data in near real time, aggregate all that data because I'm getting it from dozens of different ad servers that are actually around the world showing these ads, copying these log files over to a system. And I was grabbing the logs out of that system and having to process through gigabytes of data, you know, every couple of minutes, get that back into the database in real time so that we knew which ad we could sell next time. I look back on what I built as one of the best engineering things I've ever done in my career. Um, but I was really burned out and it was really hard for me to try to figure out, okay, so I, I basically took that whole month of November off in 2009 and tried to figure out like, what do I even want to do? Like, do I want to find another job? Do I want to leave tech? And then I realized like, oh wait, my wife's not working. We need health benefits. and My health benefits are going to run out at the end of November. I better find a new job. So I found another job that I was kind of meh about. Worked that job for the month of December. Literally walked away from that job because uh, it was it was a very toxic place to work. Um, and then I ended up at a gaming company, and that revitalized everything that I wanted to do because that's what got me into programming in the first place. So long story short, too late. I think to when you think about burnout, burnout's a real thing, and it can happen to anybody. What worked for me was remembering why I got into programming in the first place and ending up finding a job at a company doing what I always wanted to be doing. And in this case, you know, I grew up playing video games and learning how to hack into video games and thinking, I want to be a game developer someday. I didn't actually get to code any games, but I got to work at a gaming company for almost two years. And it was so much fun. It was a lot of fun. I got to work with people who were actually building casual games. Um, so it wasn't like any real big giant title or anything like that. One of the games that our company developed, uh, or this guy named Joey that, that developed the game, um, he developed this game that went on to influence Angry Birds. Angry Birds came out like, a month or two after Joey's game came out. So we're like, they saw that game and they, they copied it. They just made it about birds instead. Um, but if you, if you search for armor games and look up the game Crush the Castle, it's basically you've got a catapult and you fling something at a castle and the idea is you got to topple this castle over and crush people inside. Um, and, you know, down with the patriarchy and like crush the king and queen and, you know, all the guards and whatever. And you basically had to kill everybody on the map. Well, that influenced Angry Birds where you're flinging birds and you got to kill all the pigs or whatever it was. Um, so if you're familiar with Angry Birds, it was influenced by Crush the Castle that Joey made at Armor Games. And like being able to watch that dynamic, it's like, wow, look at all that. And I actually built, um, I built the whole API back end of the, uh, what do they call them, uh, microtransactions. Uh, using PayPal API back in 2010, 2011, uh, when Zynga was out doing Farmville and the first year that Zynga was doing microtransactions, they made like a hundred million dollars and everybody's like, holy crap, you can actually sell like $1 power-ups. Of course, nowadays the video games are like, hey, we got this hundred dollar power-up that you can go buy. It's like, well, what happened to the micro part of microtransactions? But, but that's what got me out of burnout juggling is... Um, 
it it can be it can be very revitalizing to think about why you got into programming in the first place and was there something that you envisioned doing that really got you excited about programming in the first place is it possible to find a job doing that or even doing some freelance work doing that like right now i mean what are my passions i mean i love working at postman i absolutely love my job at postman and i get a lot of stuff done uh, i'm going to be teaching a bunch of uh teaching a bunch of classes and and uh and stuff coming up you know getting out to conferences and meeting people and working a booth and doing you know speaking at, at conferences and all this kind of stuff it's going to be a lot of fun uh you know just the next couple of months alone uh next thursday morning i'm going to be doing a live stream where we use a company's api to build a live stream and that live stream is going to be a camera on one of my 3d printers um so I put a little teaser on LinkedIn. I'm like, I'm not saying I'm going to give something away on that live stream, but I'm definitely not saying that I'm not going to give something away on that live stream. Um, I don't know what I'm going to give away, but whatever it is I end up 3D printing, I'm going to give away on that stream because I can do that. It's fun. And so I think if you can figure out, like, what did you envision doing when you got into programming, when you got into coding, what was it that you wanted to do? What problem did you want to solve in the world? And is there, is there a way to find a job in that? Now, the job market right now is garbage. It's a huge dumpster fire. But if there's a way that you can do some freelance work or do some side projects or something like that where you can re-energize that passion for why you got into coding in the first place, I think that that can really help. I'm not saying that's the ultimate answer. But I think it's it's a direction that you could explore. Hopefully that'll hopefully it'll help out. I know it was a really long answer, but hopefully that'll help out. Um, I think my dream job is to get a web dev for a triple A game studio. I mean, it's it's hard to get a job at those game studios where you're also not going to burn out. I mean, I will tell you from experience, game like really big game companies will burn you out faster than anything um, because they work you really hard, they push you really hard, they push you really fast. You don't always have time to do things properly. And as a newer developer or a, you know, new in their industry, at least you end up with all the grunt work. That's not very fun, not very glamorous. Um, it's not like, oh, I designed, you know, the latest armor in Fortnite or in PUBG or anything like that. Like you're not going to be that person. Like I, I promise you're not going to be that person when you get a job in, in uh, a gaming company you're going to start with like the lowest rung of like the most menial kind of work. It's just, that's how they roll. And they, because it's so competitive, everybody wants a job working at AAA game studio. They end up paying those new people really, really low wages because if you don't want that job, there are like 50,000 other people waiting behind you to take that job. So, uh, group of thanks for the, uh, thanks for the follow. Um, you remember playing that game on mini clip back in the day? Yeah. So Crush the Castle started on Armor Games and then after a while they would like, um, well, what do they call it? Um, they would syndicate the game out to other websites. And uh, yeah, there was, there was a lot of stuff on Armor Games. It was a lot of fun to work there. I've actually, I actually did a voiceover on, on one of the games. Um, <laughs> John Cooney, who is, who is kind of the lead game developer for the company, he, would, he was coming out with Flash games like every month, basically, like every month or two. John and Joey would be building some new game and then they would have all these people around the world that they would contract to build games. And John built this game where it was basically just a button masher and you had to just keep doing all these things. And, you know, uh, if you built up power to a certain point, it would throw this combo move. And he's like, I need to find like this really reverby, echoey, like, you know, thing. And so I'm like, give me your microphone. And he's like, what? I'm like, just give me your microphone. I'm like, epic combo. And I did like this really deep, really throaty kind of voice. And he's like, holy crap, what was that? And so he went in and he mixed it and he made it even lower as an octave. And so it was this epic combo kind of voiceover. So if you find John's game called Epic Combo, that's my voice uh, doing that. But that was like my only contribution to, <laughs> to like actually helping on any games uh, other than building out the microtransaction thing. But that was, it was a lot of fun for sure. Um, so juggling also started in code because of games. 
Um, yeah, I mean, if you could, if you could find ways of like looping back into like, what are you passionate about? Like, what do you envision doing? Um, but the, the gaming industry as a whole is, is going to be really tough to get into for sure. Imposter syndrome also kicks in. I've, I've been there too. Um, I, I worry a little bit just in my own self that imposter syndrome has never really gone away for me. Like I've, I've been in the industry a long time. I can code. Clearly I can code. I do all this automation stuff and I, you know, I build APIs like all day, every day. I do 3D design. Like I've, I've got skills, but I think, I think the job market really brings out imposter syndrome for me and a, and a lot of other people where they want the best of the best. And if you're not the best of the best, you must be garbage, you know, is, is kind of the feeling that sort of creeps up. And I don't know where that starts. Is it, is it inherent? Is it an inherent thing that, you know, we just kind of learn and, and, you know, it just kind of sticks with us. But for me, that imposter syndrome has never gone away. Like I know I can code. I can code websites. I can build APIs. I'm not very good at the front end design of things, but I can code. But I think imposter syndrome never really truly goes away for me. It'll, it'll kind of dampen a little bit, but then something will happen and be like, oh, I'm not good enough for like, oh, that video that I made for work isn't good enough. I need to re-record it for the 23rd time this week, you know, because it wasn't quite perfect. You know, I think, I think imposter syndrome, perfectionism, um, you know, they, they are a very, um, a very dangerous couple of feelings to have. And I deal with it all the time. I don't have a good answer for it. So, uh, RC Maniac also ended up or almost ended up at Rockstar Games. Um, I, so going, going back and think about the, the ad tech company that I worked for, where I'm reading in all this aggregate data, trying to process it in real time to like make other decisions. Uh, when I was leading that job, I actually found a job post for Riot Games who makes League of Legends. And uh, they had a job post that was almost identical like for what I did at my job. And I'm like, how cool would it be to go get that job at Riot Games? Um, and so I applied for it and I never got any response. And I'm like, okay, well, maybe they saw something in my application. They didn't want me, whatever. And so I moved on and I, I went and I found this other job that uh, I ended up hating and I walked away from and then I got the job at Armored Games. It was like two years later, I got an email from Riot Games going, hey, we saw your application. We'd love to have you interview for that job. It's like, yeah, I've been so far removed from any of that. Like I wouldn't even, well, it's not that I wouldn't know how to go back and rebuild it, but like it wasn't as fresh in my brain. It's like, why did you wait two years to contact me? Like that's a ridiculous long time to, uh, to wait to follow up with someone on a job. Uh, anyway. Culminator, thank you for the uh, for the follow as well as uh, it's wood legs. Um, thanks for the follows. Appreciate that. Saw little blinky lights and uh, and stuff in the background here when you followed. So thanks for uh, thanks for that. Uh, Gee, who's Jay? Thanks for dropping by. We'll uh, we'll catch you soon on uh, in our gaming. Darth Gollum, good to see you as well. Um, Riot Games is pretty much the holy grail of game studios. It'd be awesome to work there. I mean, my wife had a friend when we lived in uh, Santa Monica. She got to be friends with a lady whose husband was like one of the upper tier managers on the God of War series. Um, I don't even know what game studio that is anymore, but, um, but yeah, he, he actually worked on like a couple of the first versions of God of War um, on the management side. Like he was like a product manager or something for their, uh, for their games. And then they ended up, moving him over to Germany or something from, uh, from California, they wanted him to, to work the game studio over in Germany to work on whatever that next iteration of the game was at the time. So Ray Haynes, thanks for the follow as well. Thanks for, uh, thanks for dropping by. Always curious how folks find the, uh, find the stream. Um, but yeah, thanks for coming by. I'm Ian Douglas. I'm the author of the website, techinterview.guide. And I, I like to help people out with interview prep and career prep and just commiserate about things I've gone through in my career. Uh, I've been a developer for a really, really long time. I've been in management roles. And so I, I try to help people out with, you know, how do I get a job in tech? Um, 
you know, how do I even stand out anymore? Like tens of thousands of people are getting laid off all the time. Like every time we turn around, Salesforce is laying off, Amazon's laying off, you know, Goldman Sachs is laying off, like all these, you know, giant companies that we thought would never need to do layoffs are now doing layoffs. And how do we even compete with the job market with those kinds of people? Um, but I got a lot of, I got a lot of thoughts and ideas on how to stand out, how to get people's attention, how to stand out as candidates and things like that. So if you got questions, you're absolutely always welcome to ask. Um, as well, if you want to ever ask anything anonymously, like if you have a question that you want to bring up anonymously, you're welcome to do that. You can just send a whisper to the bot, um, and, uh, send a whisper over there and, uh, it'll show up in chat as an anonymous question. And it'll also, if I'm ever not streaming, it'll also start a thread over on our Discord community. Uh, if you want to join us on Discord, um, let me throw that link in here too. Um, you're welcome to join us over on Discord as well. But it'll start a thread in a channel on Discord called Anonymous Questions. And, and basically every reply that you send into the whisper uh, to the bot, um, if I need more context or anything like that, you can just add another message as a whisper to the bot and then it'll remember who you were. And it'll basically build a thread in discord so if i'm ever not streaming you can still come by and ask a question in chat and it'll end up on discord anonymously and it'll also show us here in chat um, as an anonymous question like the bot will basically take your question and say oh we had an anonymous question come in you just have to keep it short um, because twitch only allows for 500 characters and some of that is the is my chat bot going hey we had an anonymous question uh, with the, you know, the asterisk and, and things like that. So you won't be able to put like a really big question in there. But if I do need more context, I'll ask for more context. You just send another whisper to the bot and it'll follow up in, uh, in chat as well. Uh, periodically check the software game development section. Awesome. Thanks for coming by. Tech industry has been wild. Just got hit with the layoff today. Oh no. I'm sorry to hear that, Ray. Um, yeah, it's, it sucks. It really does. We've had a lot of people come by the channel getting laid off. I think I think the first thing to do is just take a breath and know you're going to get another job. You got through an interview process once, you'll get through it again. It's, it's difficult to think about for sure. And suddenly having to scramble and build a resume is not fun. Um, I kind of give advice on the channel from time to time where I say like waiting, waiting until you leave a job to start building a resume and then having to remember what all you did at that job is not the right time to come up with that information. While you're at the job, you need to start building your resume of, I did this, I worked on this, this was the impact that it had. Because once you leave that job or you get laid off, you have a lot harder time going back and recalling, like, what was that project that I did like six months ago or a year ago? There was something else. I know I did something with auth, but I can't remember what it was now. You got to keep the track of that stuff while you're at your job. Now that you've left the job, you don't have access to the code. You don't have access to benchmarks that you might have done. Um, because when you build out a resume, you want to build out more than just, I did this thing, I did this thing, I did this thing. You want to be able to say, I did this thing and it made this 20% faster. I did this thing and it brought in, you know, an extra 100,000 in revenue. I did this thing and, you know, it reduced everybody's time in meetings by, you know, half. Like you want to talk about the impact that you had on on the job that you had and it's a lot harder to do once you leave the job so ray i know it's it's a little late to bring this up for you but like you know while it's fresh in your memory start working backwards and try to think of all the things that you contributed to what kind of impact that that had um i usually tell people when you build a resume build a really really big resume put everything on it every skill every library every project you ever worked on at work every detail about everything it's going to be huge and that's not the resume you're going to submit when you apply for a job, but you're going to make an enormous resume with all this information. When you go to apply for a job, you're going to make a copy of it and you're going to trim it back down to a page or two, depending on your work history and your work experience, however long you want your resume to be. And you're going to trim it back down to that length by removing anything that whatever company you're applying to isn't going to care about. So if you want to get into the gaming industry, take out stuff that's not related to gaming. You know, if you've worked on little side games, if you've worked on things like microtransactions, if you've worked on APIs, you know, things like that, put that stuff on the resume. They're going to care about that. Um, but there are going to be languages and, and libraries that you've used that they're not going to give a rip about. So leave that stuff off the resume. You want them to look at the resume and go, this person has all of the skills that we need. If you need to fill up more room, then you can add other stuff back in. 
but you start by trimming it back down to a reasonable length, usually a page, but if, if you need two pages, that's okay. But trim it back down by removing everything that that company doesn't care about. It's the best advice I can give you on a resume. So every time you're at a job, you have some new project that you're taking on, some new responsibility, you go update that really long resume. It's like this long growing, long living document that you're always contributing to, but you want that on like a Google Drive on your personal account, not on a work account. Because when you lose that job, you lose access to that stuff. You don't want to, you don't want to forget that stuff. So you have to be able to put all this stuff in a private Google Doc that you still will have access to when you leave that job. Uh, luckily for me, I've learned from years of experience to build out that resume while working. Good for you. I usually also interview while employed as well to keep myself on my toes. That's awesome. I do the same thing. I haven't in, well, since I've got the job at, at Postman where I work, um, I actually have not routinely interviewed like I have in the past. I've been reached out to a ton though by companies going, we're looking to hire our first uh, developer relations person or developer advocate. It's like, I'm not going to be the first person on your team. I'm not interested in like, starting a whole DevRel program or developer advocacy program and managing it and doing all the work. Like those, those are two different jobs in and of itself. Um, but, uh, yeah, I actually haven't interviewed since I got this job last January. Um, but I used to, I used to do the same thing, like maybe once a quarter at most every six months, I would just go interview for some other job. I wasn't looking for work, but I wanted to stay on my toes. I wanted to, you know, remember you know what the what the pressure of the interviewing was like as well as to learn how other companies interviewed especially when i was in a management role it helped me go back and refine my own interview process by thinking of oh wow i really like the way that they did that or oh wow i never want my interviewers at my company to do what that person just did and i would go back and i would call a meeting right away and be like hey next time you interview somebody don't ever do this because it's a it's a really bad experience um and just being really upfront with the, with the team of like, you know, I went and interviewed with this company and, and they were looking for such and such a role. So I thought, well, what the heck I'm going to go interview. And I would bring notes back. This is what I, this is what I went through. This is what I learned. And it helped make them better interviewers. It helped me design better interview processes as a manager. Um, cause I kind of went back and forth between management and contributor. So it was, it was always interesting to, to go do those interviews. So kudos to you for, uh, or keeping your toes, uh, keeping, keeping, keeping yourself sharp. So I'm at a point in my career where I get head hunted pretty often. Awesome. Uh, you're giving top tier advice. I appreciate that. Um, I'm also a big fan of having folks like yourself, Ray, drop your own little nuggets in chat. Um, I'm all about collaborative learning. So you'll see like down in the, uh, actually I don't have it on the screen, but, um, I usually tell people like, if you ever have helpful advice, absolutely put that in chat. If someone asks a question and you've got a thought, Please, please, please. RC Maniac is fantastic for this too. Um, giving feedback and, and stuff like that. I always appreciate having RC Maniac come by. Um, so please, by all means, add your own little nuggets as well. Um, having a look through here. I know I missed a bunch of stuff in chat, so I'm just kind of going to go back here. Um, so juggling says with uh, tech layoffs and recession now being shown more in the media, is there an update to my recommendation for new people to get into tech? I always take in mind to make a project tailored to a company. That's a great question. Um, so the, the advice that I started giving out last year was start building a project as like a skeleton that you can kind of continue to bolt other things onto where you show the fundamentals of what it means to be a web developer. So maybe you need a little bit of HTML, a little bit of CSS. You need some backend. Depending on where your strengths lie, you can focus more on one or the other. But you want to show the fundamentals of the kind of development that you do. So if you're a front-end developer, you want to show, I know how the browser works. I understand the event loop. I understand HTML and CSS and how those events fire and how they're going to you know, make different things happen. You're going to show them React or components or whatever framework you use. If you're on the back end, you understand how those requests come in, how they get processed, how that routes through your code. Um, but you're going to do things like authentication and databases, um, maybe session management. On the front end, you, you can do some amount of auth and session management as well and cookies and things like that. But you want to show those fundamentals. 
What I don't want that project to become for you though, is like you must build a project with these 25 things, otherwise you're not a developer. Because I think those lists are garbage and they really contribute to the imposter syndrome that, that we just talked about a minute ago. Quite often I'll see people like, oh, you wanna get into web development, you need to know these 10 things. Well, these 10 things are like enormous things and for each of those 10 things, you gotta go learn five other things. Um, and so they make it sound really simple, like, oh, you can learn web development in 10 easy steps. You know, step one, go learn these other 10 technologies. And step two is go learn another 10 technologies. And step three, go learn what Docker is. It's like, these are all enormous tasks in and of themselves. Like it's, it's a lot harder than just telling somebody like, go learn HTML and then go learn CSS and then go learn JavaScript and voila, you're a front end developer. It's like, no, there's so much more to it than that. At the same time though, you don't want to get caught up in like, you must know these hundred things or you're never going to get through an interview. So I usually tell people, don't pay attention to those lists. Those lists are garbage, but you do need to be able to show the fundamentals of what it means to be a web developer. So whether you're full stack, front end or back end, you need to figure out how you want to draw that line yourself and then figure out, okay, what are the fundamentals that I need to show? If I'm dealing with incoming requests from a browser, it's probably going to be just get requests so I don't have to get into post and delete and whatever. But if I'm doing backend and I'm building out APIs, I need to be able to show what it means to build an API. I need to show what it means to be a backend developer. What's, what's going to be more uh, part of the backend than it would be on the front end? Well, get into the database, get into calling other APIs and services or whatever. And so you can build a project where you're showing the start of those fundamentals of like, this is what I know. It doesn't have to be an enormous project. You don't want this project to take you months and months. It should be something ideally that you can build over a weekend or maybe over a couple of weekends where you're just showing the core basics of the fundamentals of, I understand how to do routing. I understand how to take in a request, process it and send back a response of some kind. And then from there, whether you're front end or back end, Focus on the technologies for that. If you're doing full stack, you're going to have to do a little bit of both. But figure out what are those core competencies that I need to be able to exhibit. And then that's the project that you're going to highlight on your resume. And say, here, here are the fundamentals that I know how to do. And if you think about something new, then go in and, and add that stuff. Moco made, showing up in chat. Moco made, check it out. Look what I got. Let's go. <laughs> but a Moco made hat. What's going on? Good to have uh, Moco made coming by. <laughs> Sorry, I don't have muscles like uh, like Derek, but let's go. <laughs> Love supporting other streamers. I got my uh, my Amish Ace beanie in the other day too. So um, anyway, thanks for uh, thanks for dropping by, Moco made. Uh, Moco made has an amazing channel. Everybody, go go give them a follow if you're into like making stuff of any kind whether it's leather paint uh 3d printing like modeling they have such a supportive community over there for people that make stuff um so i, I don't know if this is derek or devin but uh thanks for dropping by i'm, I'm making uh, this really cool thing up here it's uh 3d printing on my printer right now it's a uh, it's a treasure chest with a with an octopus tentacle it's not my model but i went and i digitally painted it. it's got like another day and a half or two days or something before it finishes printing but uh but yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. I've, I've been 3D printing like lightsabers and stuff like that. And I went into Moco Maid's uh, uh, channel to get some advice on, on hand painting it. And then I gave it to Amish Ace. Uh, and, and it turns out, I think Amish Ace was actually lurking in their channel, watching me ask for this advice. And then he gets it in the mail. He's like, what the heck? It was a lot of fun. Um, anyway, what was I talking about? Um, oh, so building out a project of how do, how do I show the fundamentals of what we're doing? And then if you get asked by a company like, hey, we want you to do this take-home assignment, then you can say, well, hey, instead of building that whole thing from scratch, I've got this sort of skeleton project that I've started building where I can show these fundamentals. Is it okay if I just add some of that functionality on top of this project that I've already got? And then you can kind of see the scope of everything that I know how to do. And I'm just going to take this thing that you want me to do and, and add it onto here. Or do you really like... Is it absolutely required that I make this a total standalone kind of thing? Sometimes it'll be a total standalone kind of thing and you, you're going to have to make that, uh, you know, have that discussion with them and, and you know, discern what you want to do. 
Um, but when I was on my job hunt a year ago, I had a company say, we want you to build an API, deploy it, you know, show us what you know about the cloud. And so I did. The next company that I was interviewing with, they're like, hey, we want you to build some code and deploy it. And I'm like, well, I just did this for this other company. You want to check that out? And I gave them the code. I showed them how to, how to find it. And they're like, yep, that's enough. That's all we needed. Thanks. And I didn't have to go do another whole project. And so if you can start with the skeleton project or the scaffold of a project of, you know, I know how to do these fundamentals. And if you want me to do this take home assignment, I'm just going to bolt it onto this thing that I've already got. Then you're going to find that a lot of companies, they might just look at that whole project that you've already got and be like, actually, that's all we need. That's fine. Like we can see the logic of what you're doing and we see that you know these fundamentals, like you're proving that you know this stuff. And if you can add their stuff into or add their code into your code, it it's showing them you know how to maintain legacy code to add new features and whatever. Like these are all skills that they want you to have. And I think it's a lot more practical way of of, uh, of working, especially in the software industry when it's so rocky right now. I think that that's going to be a, an easier way to go for a lot of folks. So. It is Derek. Awesome. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks, Derek, for your community. Your community is fantastic. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and your wisdom and just the enthusiasm of, of helping people out. It's very, very much appreciated. Um, I love, I love lurking. I don't know. I don't get to lurk every day, but uh, I like, I like having it on in the background and, and just, you know, doing, uh, doing the reviews and like really encouraging other people to, uh, to keep going. I think is, is a fantastic way to, to build out a community and run a community. So I really appreciate that. Um, so yeah, so hopefully, hopefully that'll, that'll give some, uh, some feedback to, uh, to juggling about, uh, you know, how to come up with these projects and things like that. Cause I, I think if, if you can, if you can design kind of that core, like I say, fundamentals project, whatever you want to call it, and just highlight that on your resume and be like, you know, I'm, I'm new in the industry, but I've built this thing to kind of highlight and showcase the fundamentals as I know them. And as I learn more things, I'm going to keep adding to this project. Like that project's never really going to be done. Um, but you don't want it to be this large gangly kind of thing that just, you know, whatever. But if they want you to build out a new project, guess what? You've already got a project that you can start with. It's already got some database. It's already got some auth. It's already got some sessions. It's already got some basic routing. Uh, maybe it has some API access where you're calling an API. Like you've already got those fundamentals. You can now just take that and use that to kind of launch and kickstart a whole new project that you want to make. And you don't have to go reinvent that stuff every time. So it's also a good way of like forking that project off to go build something new. Uh, Culminator, good to see you in chat as well. Thanks for uh, the follow earlier tonight. Uh, budgets are being finalized. There's a ton of job postings ramping up right now. I think a lot of companies would be like, oh, shoot, Salesforce and Amazon just laid off a bunch of people. Let's get them in here. Let's, you know, let's see some, uh, you know, get get some of those folks in and uh, get them interviewing and so on. So some companies are going to be vying for those people and, and really trying to target, like, if you used to work at Amazon, then, you know, come work for us. I think there's going to be some of that. Uh, me Machine Rex, thanks for the follow. Appreciate that. Um, I used to have these lights behind me blink really fast when somebody followed. And then I thought about the accessibility of like lights flashing and being super bright and like how some people are really sensitive to that. So I actually slowed it down quite a bit, but appreciate the follow. Um, so yeah, last Thursday we uh, we hooked up a Raspberry Pi to a Lego kit back here. So if you do exclamation point, pew, pew, uh, you'll, you'll hear a little Darth Vader thing kick in. But uh, let me change my screen over here. You might see it a tiny bit better. But you'll see you'll see the lights alternate on uh, a couple of Tie Fighters as well as there's a cannon in here. Here we go. So that was a lot of fun to build. Uh, it's just a tiny little Raspberry Pi, and we wired all the wires in there. So one one pin on the Raspberry Pi is like lighting up all the lights that you see on all the time, and then uh, a couple other pins are like doing all the alternating lights. So it was a lot of fun. We did that last week. Um, I've got another light kit for the BD1 robot that's sitting over here, and uh, so we'll do that at some point. And then I've got an X-Wing fighter and a light kit for that. And then I've just got like just a bunch of other random Lego kind of uh, kits as well. Um, so I'm getting a whole new cabinet over here in my workspace. I know I don't have a cool camera angle like uh, Moco made uh, showing all the all the bits and bobs of, of what I got going in here. But uh, got a little, little clusters of clutter like, oh, I need to find a place to put these books. So I'm just going to put them on the 
precipitous corner of this desk right now. Um, but I'm going to be building out a whole new workbench next week. Um, I've got a new tabletop coming in fr on Friday and I'm going to build a whole new workbench uh, on this side of where the screen is. Or I might take all this stuff and like shove it that way about 10 feet and build the workbench to be a along this wall. And so you might show up on screen and you'll see a lot more of these lights in the background because there's actually four levels of these lights up the wall. Um, and if I push all this stuff that way, you're going to get to see a lot more of that wall. So we'll, we'll see how that plays out. Not sure what's going to happen because like this TV will be, you know, half that, half that height if I, uh, if I push it back that far, but we'll, uh, we'll see how that kind of plans out, uh, over the coming weeks. But, uh, yeah, I'm going to be reorganizing some stuff in here as I get new cabinets and new workbenches and stuff. And so I might, I might see if I can hook up new cameras. Um, uh, I sometimes have problems with the system handling the cameras I've already got, much less have a ton of other cameras, but. Um, I can't wait till we put that cam on a rail to move around the studio a bit. That would be awesome. So I just, uh, Derek, I actually just found these extrusions today. Um, cause I've got, I've got three stream decks now and I'm like, I want to, I want to put these extrusions together on a, on an angle like this. And so I designed out a little 3d part that's going to fit in here. It's printing right now. Um, I printed one earlier, but it ended up being way too big, but I, I modeled out a, a little 3d thing and printed it off, but it's, it's too, it's too big. Um, so I'm, I'm printing it slightly smaller, but I want this to sit at a 30 degree angle. And then I've got these smaller extrusions that are going to sit on here kind of as feet. And so this will lie down on the, on the desk. And then i want to find a way to mount the stream decks on this rail here. So it won't, it won't be a camera panning back and forth, but I'll have a place to mount my stream decks, um, on an angle. So that's, uh, that's the next plan for that one. But yeah, I get into doing all kinds of neat stuff. I made a, uh, there's a really popular headphone stand by Matter Hackers, and I upsized it quite a lot. And uh, I pulled it into my pulled it into my slicer and put some color on it and printed that out. But it was so big it was in two parts. But now it's it's big enough that I can fit my headphones and have the charging plug come off the bottom here, and the charging cable doesn't like bend at a weird angle on my desk because the other one used to be a lot shorter. Um, but it was, it was fun just digitally painting that. So that's not hand painted. That was all done by my printer. Um, but it was a, a great little model. So I, I like doing more practical stuff these days than doing the, the goofy stuff, but the goofy stuff is fun too. Getting into like, I work for a company called Postman and our, our logo is uh, a little astronaut. So I made these little Postmanot figurines. So I'm, I'm sending this one. I've got another one in white and I'm actually going to be sending these to some coworkers. And then I printed them in resin as well. So these are actually done on, on a regular 3D printer. This one's done on a resin printer. And so part of what I want to do on the stream on Thursday nights is go into more maker mode where I'm like, here's how I post-process a 3D print. How do I sand this stuff off the bottom? Do I need to fill in these drain holes or not? Um, and then how do I paint this? You know, this one's also got lightning bolts on his faceplate where this one didn't. Um, so how do I go in and paint these things? you know, kind of from the inside out. How do I, how do I post process this? So I just bought a, uh, a little airbrush kit. I've never airbrushed before, so I'm going to learn how to airbrush. Um, so yeah, I'm going to stretch myself in a lot of ways this year. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, is it MakerBot? Oh yeah, it is MakerBot, not Matter Hackers. You're right. Thanks for the clarification, RC. So yeah, um, so my Thursday stream is going to be more maker stuff uh, and setting up cameras on the workbench here where I do painting and post-processing and sanding and stuff like that. Um, buying this other stream deck now, I've got more buttons where I can like, you know, change which microphone I'm on um, and then change the camera views and things like that. And then I want to activate the lights based on, you know, if I'm going to work on the desk, I want to activate the lights and the cameras, you know, before I go live, all that kind of stuff, just so that stuff's a little more prepared. And then I got channel point redemptions for changing the beanie. So I'll swap between my Moko made and my Amish ace. And I've got like a handful of other beanies and hats and things like that, that I'll rotate through. But man, I really love the, the leather imprint on the, on the Moko made stuff. You guys do some really cool work. Yeah, it's good stuff. Um, Postman, that's cool. It's fantastic. I was, oh, it's fantastic to all I was advocate. Appreciate that. Um, so yeah, I'm actually, uh, I'm kind of the program manager now for our live stream that happens every Thursday, uh, in the mornings. 
So that's, that's a lot of fun. So if I'm not the one on the live stream that I'm going to be sort of facilitating and moderating and stuff like that. Um, next Thursday, I'm actually going to be doing a live stream for Postman where I live stream one of my 3D printers. And uh, we're going to be building a live stream using this company's API. They do live streaming. And so we're going to be doing a live stream where I build a live stream of my 3D printer printing something. And I want to time it in a way that at the end of the stream, the print is done. And then I'm going to maybe give away what's been printing. So I put a little teaser on LinkedIn where I said, I'm not saying I'm going to give something away, but I'm definitely not saying that I'm not giving something away. Wait, I think my grammar on that's wrong. I wanted to give the impression that I'm actually giving something away on the stream. Anyway, I'll, I'll figure out the I'll figure out the grammar on that. Um, but yeah, we're gonna we're gonna make a live stream of a live stream of a 3D printer, and then I'm gonna give away what uh, what I'm 3D printing. So I need to figure out something that I can 3D print start the night before so that it's finished. And because I want to do you know like maybe do more of these little like postmonot figurines or something. This will take like 10 hours or 15 hours or something to print this thing. So I have to start it the night before because our stream's only 90, 90 minutes long at most. So I have to start this ahead of time. So it'll be like mostly finished. And then like it'll just finish printing the helmet or whatever on the stream. And then I'll be like, all right, this thing's done. Who wants it? Or something like that. So I'm, I'm taking the approach that it'll be a lot easier to ask my manager for forgiveness when I offer to ship that thing around the world and pay for and have the company pay for the postage than to ask for permission ahead of time. That's what I'm going with. Double negative the statement. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to like word it in a way that people are like, wait, is he saying he's actually giving something away? That's what I wanted to go for. I need to need to fix that. So yeah, so I'm going to change up the, the work area slash studio. I also want to get a contractor in here and like insulate this thing and get some soundproofing in here because everybody in the house on the ground level of the house can hear what I do down here in the basement. And it's also friggin freezing cold down here all the time so i've got like a little space heater now that fits under my desk which is fantastic keeps me toasty warm while i live stream late at night um but it also uses an enormous amount of power um so i need to i need to insulate a little bit better down here figure out something to put on the floor to help insulate the floor a bit um so yeah i'm thinking this desk is either gonna shove that way like eight more feet and build another workbench here where you can kind of see like the painting and stuff i do or I'll just build the other workbench over here and I'll just like leave this desk and go around to the other desk or something. But I think it'd be better if I push this stuff out that way and you'll get to see more of the wall back here. And then, uh, so yeah, my to-do list, if you do bang to-do, uh, you'll see I've got ideas. Like I want to hang up that dark saber um, on these little wedges in between my nano leaf lights. So those are just little 3D printed things, but I want to make those 3D things, uh, I want, or at least make a couple of them that will actually go into a stud and then have little hooks come out kind of like a pegboard that I can hang that dark saber on. Uh, like I want to do stuff like that and maybe get some little shelves for the, for the Lego stuff. Um, uh, if anybody knows Babe Ross, uh, here on Twitch, this is one of her paintings over here. Um, and I've got a second one of her paintings. Um, and it's over on another part of the, the basement, but, um, you know, I love to showcase stuff that other people do. So the spider Gwen it's, uh, yeah, let me grab that. This is an enormous 3D print, and uh, this is a compliment to my printer. My printer did all of this color change. And then I went over it with a quick coat of paint just to even out the color a little bit. Um, I mean, it was pretty even, but there was, there was a little bit of color bleed on her, on her uh, hood here, for example, because it was printing uh, the dark pink on the inside. And so there was a, a very thin strip of pink on the outside of her hood. So I just went over that with, with white paint real quick. And then I did a coat of black on her legs just to, to make, the, uh, make it a little shiny. But yeah, it's an it's enormous print. It's, uh, it's almost two feet tall. And uh, I did another one of a, of a Superman figurine that I showed on the stream for a while. And I actually gave that away to a friend for Christmas who's a huge Superman fan. So yeah. There's uh, there's Spider Gwen. It's a fantastic model. 
Um, I think I paid like 10 or 15 bucks for the model. And then I supersized it, made it much, much bigger than, than usual. And it prints in lots of pieces. Like each arm is a separate piece. Torso is a piece. Legs are a piece. Um, the head is the mask and the hood. But there's also a version of her head where the hood is pulled down. And so you see her face with the uh, with her hair. And then there's another version of it with the, with the hood up with no mask. So you see her face with the hood. So they had different heads that you could print and just put a different head on. And then the, uh, the backpack was three different pieces. So the backpack body with the drumsticks and then each strap was a separate piece. Uh, sorry, it was four pieces. This, this pouch here with the part going under her arm, this was another separate piece. But yeah, it was a lot of fun to print. It took, uh, took almost a week to print this. Um, didn't take any time at all to go in and just put a quick uh, coat of paint on it, but it was a lot of fun. The paint is so good, wouldn't be able to tell it was in different pieces. I mean, a lot of that was, uh, I mean, some of, the, some of the lines are hidden. So, and also I didn't glue her into the base, but for example, you know, on her back here, you can kind of see, uh, you know, where the, where the arm attached. Well, if I can get that a little bit closer, you'd see it. So you can, you can kind of see like on her shoulders there where the shoulders attach. Um, and then you can kind of see, I don't want to, I don't want to make this like a butt stream or anything like that, but you can see, you can see the seam right here where, uh, where the torso attaches to her legs. You can see it a little bit on the front here as well across her abdomen. You can see where that, that joins in as well. But yeah, it was a really fun print. It took a long time. A lot of lessons learned around, uh, like color bleed and, and things like that on 3d prints but uh yeah it worked out great it's it's one of it's one of my favorite things that i've, I've 3d printed i also made like a really enormous uh, deadpool bust um and i did that in multiple colors as well so it's actually actually this model but i went through and i digitally painted it uh where the base was it started out black went to a green did obviously the, the red and the black and, and so on black for his swords his bandoliers came out in a tan color. It's, he's got a little playing card on here. And so I colored the ace of spades with white and, and black. And he had buckles on here that I did in silver. And so I was really strategic with the printer that as it got to a certain point, I would change out the green filament for the blue filament. And so the sword handles came in kind of a gunmetal blue. Um, the buckles started with silver. And then he's got these little clasps on his collar that, um, that when it finished the last buckle, uh, here on his front, or actually there was something here on the grenade that was silver. And as soon as it finished, I swapped it over to a white. So the buckle on his collar and his eyeball would actually come out white instead of silver. So like just being really strategic about changing out the, uh, the colors. Um, and then I got another color unit for the printer. So now I can do eight, eight colors at a time, which is what you see when I do the, uh, this screen. Oh, it's not there now. What happened to my printer? Oh, it's got to reload. Bamboo is kind of a pain about how they do their uh, their streaming process, but there's a an FFmpeg stream that it pulls off the printer now uh, to show what it's printing. And because I've got on that printer, I've got two of the color units hooked up. I could do all three of them on the one unit. Uh, I was able to color that tentacle thing with eight different colors. And so the I've got like a wood color. I've got like a multi-metal thing that, that uh, you might remember I did with uh, some of the 3D dragons that we did last year. Um, so it's like, it's a silk filament that kind of transitions between like a bronze and a gold and a brass or something like that. And so that's going to be the strapping. And then the gems alternate between like a silky dark green, like an olive green and a silky red or uh, red gold uh, from Amelin. And then the tentacle is purple where the suction cups are pink and then there's like different shades of blue like light blue and dark blue uh, spots on the tentacles as well it's a really cool model it didn't take long to digitally paint but it's going to be like a three and a half day print and it's it's about halfway done so i've got about a day and a half left on that so it's it's fun doing that kind of stuff so that's that's the kind of stuff that i want to do giveaways like the the tentacle treasure chest thing is probably going to be uh like the big giveaway that we're going to do this quarter. I'm not going to give away Spider Gwen. Um, but if somebody wants to buy Spider Gwen, you can make me an offer on Spider Gwen. I really like that. So many statue models come modular so you can have different masked, not masked faces. Yeah. 
yeah, it was it was pretty neat. And so the the designer that made this and the Superman one also made a Batman model, uh, where he's standing on um, the uh, the bat signal. And so I actually want to put LEDs in the bat signal as well. Um, so I want to print that one next. I got to figure out what colors I want to use for that one. I've got I've got a uh, a filament. I think it was from Prusa, and it's called Gentleman's Gray. And it was basically meant to be a Batman color. It's kind of that Batman gunmetal gray sort of color. Um, so I'll probably do his cape in that and then find like a light gray for his suit. Um, so yeah, it'll be, it'll be pretty fun. Uh, dad joke of the day. All right, dad joke of the day. <clears throat> Doctor, I swallowed a spoon and need to get it out. Doctor said, all right, just sit down and don't stir. Good times, good times. Uh, mean Machine Rex, thanks for the follow as well. Um, yeah, m one of my kids bought me one of these like tear away dad joke things. So. Some people think the jokes are funny. I think they're they're terrible. Oh, I, th I thought that was funny. Apparently, apparently not. Anyway, um, yeah, what else is going on? So we kind of got the the shape of the design for the for the website. Um, so for those that are that are coming in and just following, uh, I, I built out this website called Tech Interview Guide, which helps with a lot of advice and, and ideas around how to get a job in tech. Um, having been in the tech industry for a long time, having been a manager, director of engineering, I've got a lot of insight into what goes into interview processes. Um, and how they need to improve as well. So not just here's what you're going to face, but here's what companies need to be able to do um, and, and revitalize that interview process a little bit, make it friendlier to the user, but still get good signals as we call it. Um, so when I, when I first envisioned writing this as a book, I had the idea of, I, want to, I wanted to write this book that, you know, one side of it would be like, I, I wanted to call the whole book my first interview where the front of the book was, I'm a candidate and I'm going for my first interview. But if you like flip the book around and upside down, the other half of it would be my first interview as an interviewer. Like, here's how to actually do an interview. Here's what you need to do. Here's the kinds of questions to ask and why, and what kind of answers you want to listen for and why, and what to do in certain situations if, you know, something worked out or, you know, if you get the weird vibe from them, like, what do you do? Um, and so I initially wanted to write this as two different books from those two perspectives. And then I decided, you know what, I'm just going to do, I'm just going to focus on helping people find jobs because there's a whole lot more people that need a job in tech. But lately, like over the last year or two, I'm like, oh man, I, I really should have wrote that other book to tell people how to do good interviews because I get a lot of people come by the stream going, I had this really bad interview experience. This company, you know, was like, didn't treat me well. Um, and so I may get to a point where the tech interview guide is also going to be advice on, you know, if you're looking to give an interview and conduct an interview, here's what you need to know. Like here's, here's a process you can follow, or here's a blueprint that you can follow of, you know, do these steps, or these are, you know, the only stages that you really need. Like, oh, oh, there's so many things wrong with the tech interview process right now. It takes too long. They ask too many redundant questions. They ask too many questions that they don't even need to ask during an interview. And to the candidate, it's like, I got to go through eight interviews to maybe get a job offer from you. Like that's way too many. Or, you know, the company doesn't do enough interviews and then they realize after they hire somebody that they made a mistake or they forgot to ask about a particular thing and then they make an offer to the person and now it's not working out because that person ended up not having one of the skills that they really hoped the person would have. Um, and so it's, it's disappointing when those things happen to everybody involved. It's disappointing to the candidate that it didn't work out and now you're letting them go. And it's disappointing to you as a company because you spent all this time and effort hiring somebody and realize it was the wrong person to hire. So how do we fix that? Um, but right now with the tech interview process, because so many people are getting laid off and they're coming from these top tier companies, my worry is that there's going to be an over-reliance now on the leak code problems that I hate. I think the, the whole leak code thing needs to change, but if you got to go through the process and you got to jump through the leak code hoop, um, here's a couple of videos that you can, you can go watch. I just post them in chat. 
um, you can go check out those videos on how to uh, let me pull chat up here as well um, on how to do leak code a little bit better. But my wor my worry is that with all these people getting laid off, the companies are going to over rely on leak code as a metric to interview people. And that whole process needs to go away because leak code does not give the right kinds of signals, but it feels like such a ubiquitous part of what it means to do a tech interview. So my hope is that companies realize that and they start to shift their priority on what it is they really need to do in an interview. Like, what do you, what do you really need to get out of an interview? That's, that's where I think companies need to spend more time is really understanding like this is what we really need to get out of this process. So, anyway. Um, so yeah, so we got kind of the shape of, of what I want to do on the site. So I think that that was a good start. I think um, I'm getting into some of the ideas about um, Kind of that that uh, flow chart kind of idea that I had for the site of this is where I'm at in the interview process or this is where I keep falling off in the interview process. What do I do? And being able to call in some of the YouTube videos that I've been making over the past year and a half and figure out is there a way that I can blend this stuff a little bit better um, to get people like not just to get eyeballs on on the YouTube channel. Well, that's part of it. Um, but to have, have more of those resources put together in a more cohesive way so that I don't have to tell people like, Hey, I've got this website and I've got this YouTube channel and I've got a po audio podcast that you can go listen to. And I've got this and I've got that. And you can book my time and I do mock interviews. It's like, I want to give them one spot where they can go see this stuff or find the stuff. I think that that's going to be, uh, a little more beneficial for people. So that'll be. That's basically what I wanted to kind of plan out and design out tonight as as part of that website revamp, um, and then change some of the change some of the images and, and stuff on there too. So, Yo Beats TV, thanks for the follow. Appreciate you dropping by. Always curious how uh, how folks find the stream, but uh, thanks for coming by. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm Ian. I run a website called Tech Interview Guide. I do a lot of uh, live streaming around helping people with interview advice, how to get through interviews. Um, I realized last year that a lot of the advice that I give on the channel isn't really specific to just the tech industry anymore, although that is where I've spent most of my career. Um, it doesn't like the advice that I give is also applicable to other industries as well. I've had people just going to get sales jobs and marketing jobs, and they're like, yeah, I followed that advice that you gave on a resume on how to show the value that you bring to a company. And I got that interview that I didn't think I was going to get. So I still get feedback from people who are not in tech that, you know, what I, what I help with on the stream is still helpful outside of the tech industry as well. Um, and so I hope that the idea of like, oh, this is a tech interview guide, that this is only for the tech industry. So I think that there's still some nuggets that collectively we can share as a community that are not just for the tech industry. We'll, we'll we'll play with that a bit more. I might, I mean, I don't know that I would ever pivot away from the tech interview process itself because that's what I know really well. But I think I think being able to build out this content in a way that lets other people know, like, I do more than just the tech industry. Like, I can help with more than just the tech industry. Um, I think might might help a, a broader audience. But I'm I'm happy that I was able to run this stream over the past year, especially with all the layoffs and and have so many people come through. Uh, I was looking at the year end stats of how many people came through the stream and how many people viewed it and how much you know view time I've had on YouTube and stuff like that. It's really encouraging. Um, at writing uh, or doing like YouTube videos and things like that, and I really need to spend time on editing. I just don't want to. Um, you know, I think. I think I've, I want to, you know, what I already know is crippling perfectionism and, uh, you know, trying to deal with how I want to take care of that on a, on a, 
ongoing basis to help people out. So I don't want to spend all day, every day just doing, you know, YouTube edits and things like that. I had somebody actually quote me to help edit some YouTube videos. They wanted like $500 per video. I'm like, I don't make any money on this stuff. There's no way I can afford to pay somebody $500 every time I live stream to like go and edit that and clean up all the places I say, um, you know, or, or scratch my head, you know, go edit that stuff out. Like there's, there's no way that's going to happen. Like I, I, you know, unless I win the lottery, win that billion dollar lottery, I might uh, hire a full-time editor, but not right now. Um, but yeah, if anybody's got thoughts on other stuff that you think should be on the website, as far as advice and, and things like that, I'd love, I'd love, uh, other input on content that's missing. I know I've got like a whole bunch of chapters on there that, uh, that I haven't even finished yet. Like the chapters on negotiation. I'm like, oh yeah, I'm going to get around to that. It's been like two years and I have yet to go back and actually write that content, but I've got videos about it. So that's where I want to like write a little blur and be like, Hey, go watch this video. I talked about negotiations in these different videos. Um, so I want to go through and, and find that stuff. Uh, dad, dad, what's that? <laughs> that? That's hard to read. That's what that is. Um, thanks for the follow. Appreciate it. Thanks for dropping by. Um, let me uh, go catch up on chat here. It looks like I missed some stuff. Um, had a few friends who are really good at lead code, show a lot of ambition. They got interviews, but their interviewers shot them down and quickly dismissed them. What do you, why do you think recruiters do this? So there's, there's more than just lead code. Like lead code is just a, a small portion of what the interview process is. And, and when I say lead code, what I really mean is like, there's, there's a demonstration portion of the interview that we have to go through. Ours is one of the few industries where you say, I know a skill and they're like, prove it. Okay, you've proved it. Now we'll, we'll give you the job because you proved it better than somebody else proved it. But there's a demonstration portion of the interview that we have to get through. There's no getting around that. We have to demonstrate what we do because we don't have things like, you know, oh, I went and got a journeyman's ticket in elect uh, doing elect electrical work. I'm an electrician. Here's my here's my journeyman's ticket. I've put in so many hours. You know, here's proof that I've put in that many hours. And they're like, okay, cool. We'll hire you as an electrician for this construction job. Or I'm a plumber or, you know, some other blue collar type of work where they actually do licensing and, and, you know, proof of what you can do. We don't really have that in the tech industry. And some people will argue, it's like, well, we have certifications. Like I went and got that AWS certification. So clearly I must be qualified. It's like, yeah, but I still want to watch you log into AWS and do the thing. And it's a very unfortunate part of what we have to go through in our industry we shouldn't have to jump through that many hoops, but that's also part of, of why I tell people on the stream is like, you don't need eight interviews before you hire somebody. You should know within three interviews, whether you want to hire somebody or not, take a chance, hire them. Yeah. It's expensive if it doesn't work out. So you better ask them the right questions the first time so that you don't have to spend eight interview cycles and have all of these different people give you all these different signals just to tell you whether you should hire that person or not. You should know much faster than that. Um, so I think, why do, why do recruiters shoot people down after leak code? I mean, if, if they got to that point, then they've passed all of those other parts. They're not going to say, well, they failed the behavioral questions, but let's give them the technical interview anyway, just to see, just in case, you know, maybe technically they're smart. Well, if they didn't pass the behavioral questions, companies aren't going to want to hire them anyway, because it means that there's a, a fundamental flaw in how that person is going to interact on your team and you don't want to hire them anyway. And so most companies will say, as soon as you fail a portion, you don't progress on to the rest of the interview. They just drop you as a candidate at that point. So if they're getting to the point where they're getting into the technical challenge and they're doing leak code, it means that they've done well enough on the interview process so far to, to get to that stage. They're just not progressing beyond that stage. The, the good news is you can practice leak code. You can get better at leak code. The downside is it takes time. And if you're looking for a job, time tends to be the thing you don't have as much of. And so I think, um, 
I think we have to be a little bit careful of just saying like, oh, go practice more leak code or go do mock interviews so that people can actually tell you like maybe there was something fundamentally wrong with how you approached your problem solving on that particular problem. But a lot of companies are only going to give you one chance to get through that leak code challenge. And if you don't pass, you don't pass and they're going to find someone else. Hey, Rex Riker, thanks for the follow. Um, so I would say if, if, if that seems to be a routine for your friend where that's, you know, it seems like, you know, all of their interviews, that's as far as they get. And then they drop out of the interview process because they don't, they don't progress past that. Then that is something that they're going to need to practice. They do need someone who's going to give them feedback on what went well and what didn't go well. And so for something like that, they're going to have to practice with a mock interview, whether that's interviewing.io or, or uh, meetapro.com or whatever, like there are platforms out there where people can work with you on a mock interview and give you constructive feedback on, okay, you did this part really well. You were a little shaky on this part. Your explanation of this was good. Your explanation of this was not good. Um, like you need to be able to get that kind of feedback. Companies aren't going to give you that feedback. So you have to get it from somebody. The unfortunate part is a lot of these people are going to charge you for their time in order to do that. But hopefully it's going to be valuable um, as far as like a return on investment. But um, it's, it's, tough to, it's tough to think about the upfront cost of, you know, oh, I want to go do some mock interviews on interviewing IO and it's like $100 an hour. You know, and if you're already unemployed, you haven't got $100 an hour to spend on mock interviews. So you want to do that as little as possible. You know, is there a way that you can practice for free? Well, there are some free platforms. Um, I'm trying to think of the other one that people use. Um, I, had a, I had a referral code for them for a while. Uh, who's the other, who's the free platform? Um, I just completely blinked. But there is a free platform out there where you can practice mock interviews with people. Um, the problem is you don't know who you're getting paired up with. So you don't know what level of experience they're bringing. And you don't know whether they're actually going to give you a good mock interview, whether you're going to get good feedback at the end. Like you don't know whether they're also an entry-level developer or not. Um, and so that's the downside to the free platform is you don't necessarily know what kind of advice you're going to get or if you're going to get actionable feedback or not. Um, at the same time, it's free. So there is a notion of, you know, you shouldn't expect a lot if it's free, but that's the only way that you're going to get better. Um, and going back to some advice that I gave on the stream earlier tonight, if you can, if you can go to the company and say, Hey, can you tell me like two or three things I did really well on that interview? Companies are generally happy to give you positive feedback on what you did well. They just don't want to give you feedback on what you need to improve because they don't want you to misunder, misinterpret what they say and make it sound like it was bias or discrimination or something like that. And now they're in legal trouble. So a lot of companies just have a flat policy like where we just don't give any feedback of any kind to anybody for any reason whatsoever, good or bad. But if you can get a company to tell you like, hey, what, what stood out? Like, what did I do really well that I can keep doing? because I want to be able to improve. And so even if you can't give me all the feedback on stuff I need to improve, if you can tell me what I did well, I'll kind of read between the lines and figure out, you know, what, what didn't go so well. But I think, I think that, uh, that your friend specifically juggling, um, I think if, if, if they get some feedback from someone that they can practice a mock interview with, um, and get some feedback on like, you know, is it their problem solving? Is it how they think about it? Did they just take too long, too long on the design? Um, or was it a system design type of problem? Like what kind of problem was it? How did they answer, you know, and get some, get some feedback from someone else, like find someone they trust that they can get that feedback. Uh, just kind of scrolling back through chat here. Um, other devs weren't kidding when they told me the networking and interviewing and is another job in itself. Yeah, absolutely is. Um, but networking, I think, is going to get you a job faster than just cold applying to jobs and hoping for the best. I think you're far more likely to get a job when you have referrals and you do networking and you reach out to people and you stay in contact with those people. Don't just, don't just contact them once and be like, hi, I want to connect with you and talk about your company and you have a conversation with them and then you never talk to them again. Like the whole point of building a network is to nurture that network and build those connections and, and make them 
make them worthwhile. That's the point of building out that network. Uh, but yeah, Robo, so you really do have to infer like this is what I need to work on based on the feedback they do give you because a lot of companies aren't going to give you the negative feedback. Like they're not going to say like, oh yeah, your answer to the behavioral questions were, were not good. You know, but if you don't progress past that behavioral interview, you kind of know. But you're not necessarily going to know which question you didn't do well or questions if there were several. You're not necessarily going to know which ones were bad. So this is also why I give people a recommendation of recording your interview. Now, there are legalities to this, and I've covered this on the stream before. There are a handful of states in the United States where it is illegal to record a conversation where the other person doesn't know, does not know that you are recording that conversation. Most states in the United States, though, you do not need explicit permission to record a conversation as long as you are part of that conversation. Now, recording somebody else's conversation, like, you know, I'm going to listen in on what my wife is saying to my kid upstairs right now, and I'm going to record that, and I'm not going to tell either of them that I recorded it. That's illegal. Pretty much everywhere, universally, that's going to be illegal. But if it's a conversation where you are one of the people in the conversation, you don't have to get permission in most states, but check the laws in your state. If it's if it's legal for you to record that conversation, record that interview. Just have like a little digital recorder. I keep a little digital recorder here at my desk. And just record that interview. Don't put it online. Don't share it with anybody. But go back and listen to it afterwards. And if you're looking for help, then you can ask somebody that you trust or come by the stream sometime and say, hey, I was asked this behavioral question in an interview. How would you answer that question? Or I was given this question and this is how I answered it. Can you tell me how I could improve that answer? Um, I did a, a mentoring session uh, earlier this week with somebody. And uh, they were like, oh yeah, I got asked this question. This is what I said. And I'm like, well, what you should have said was, and they're like, oh, that would have been so much better to say. It's like, well, that's, that's why you have to get help from other people that know what they're talking about. Um, because it's, it's helpful to find people who have been where you are and it's helpful to get their advice and their perspectives on things. But if you're not asking for that help, you're not going to get the help. Like I'm going to be here twice a week offering help one way or the other. So if you need help, if there's something that I can help with, you can absolutely drop by and ask in the stream, Hey, if you get asked a behavioral question that says, blah, 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 how would you answer that question? I'll give you my thoughts on it. You don't have to say, oh, I recorded this question from an interview that I just had, but you can say, hey, if I were to get asked this, kinds of, this kind of question, what should I say? What should I talk about? What should I avoid talking about? Um, my email newsletters cover a lot of this stuff too. I go into like some of the more popular questions, but not so much from a here's how to answer them perfectly, but here's why we ans ask these questions in the first place. And if you understand our motivation for asking the question, and you do enough sort of background and, and research on the company to know what they care about, you're going to be able to come up with a good answer. You're going to be able to, to formulate a good answer for their question if you spend a little bit of time understanding what's important to them. That's how you're going to get through a lot of those interviews and, and really stand out to them as a candidate because your answers are going to reflect well on their mission and that's really what they're hiring for. They want someone that's going to be a good member of their team that's going to play into the mission that they're trying to accomplish as a company. RC said, I kept getting rejected until I got one company that said, hey, you're great on everything except system design. Said I had something to look into. That's exactly right. But a lot of companies aren't going to say, hey, your answer to that system design question was kind of garbage. They're just, you're going to have a system design interview and then they're going to call you up back and say, no, thank you. Well, if that was the last interview you did and they say, no, thank you, you've already got a starting point where it's like, okay, I never get past system interview problems. So maybe I need to go practice those. What is a system interview problem? How should I approach those? Now, if you're an entry level dev, you're far less likely to get asked a system design question. They save those for those of us that have actually been around the industry a couple of years. So if you're going for an intermediate level job, you may get a system design interview. If you're going for a senior or higher level position, 
you're very likely going to get a system design interview question of some kind. Now, whether they want you to design the software for a system or literally just designing out the components of a system, like I want to use this kind of database and I want to use this kind of queue management system and I want to deploy using this or that and I'm going to deploy to this cloud service over that cloud service for reasons. You know, it depends on your experience level and it depends on the question and type of question that they're asking as far as like what they're going to expect from you as an answer. Expect if they're asking more than four years, you're going to get system design. Yeah, that's a good good presumption, RC, for sure. If you've if you've got more than four years of experience, you're more like you're far more likely to get a system design interview. Um, and the more senior you get, you you're very extremely likely going to get uh, system design problems for sure. Cool. Coming up on three hours. Happy to keep answering questions. Uh, happy to just sit and nerd out with, with people too. I don't know why I'm trying to clean up these supports on this part because I'm not going to use it. Kind of treating this like a little fidget cube now. This was the little piece that I had built to try to join those extrusions together, but it was too big. So I'm printing it again at 85% scale. I thought it would have been done by now. Did the print stall? Let me go check the printer real quick. It didn't print because I'm an idiot. when that other print finished i brought the print bit over here took the stuff off the print bin put the print bit over here on my desk and then restarted the print without the print plate back on the printer gee i wonder why it didn't adhere to the print bed so spaghetti all over the place and it's like spaghetti detection went off so spaghetti detection worked great on the printer so you start making some dinner dude it's late out there you're making dinner now ridiculous then i might be able to make some fun comments so it's like practically breakfast time for you over there on the East Coast. It's not dinner time. It's midnight snack time, like literally for you. You're in your office until 10. Wow. RC Maniac's been a little busy at, uh, at work these days. Had some stuff going on. Alrighty. Well, we've been going for three hours. Let's see. Chrissy Codes is online. Or W Grimm is online. Oh, that nerd. Oh, we haven't. Uh, wait, when was the last time we? I don't remember when we last raided into Odat Nerd. I think we'll go right over there anyway. You got into the office at four thirty. Yeah, your hours are a little messed up, dude. I thought my I thought my sleep schedule was messed up. Um, actually, I just realized I restarted that print. And I didn't mean to restart it. Uh, I'm gonna stop that print. Stop. Stop. Please stop. Cool. Um, so yeah, let's go right over to Odette Nerd. And uh, yes, I want to. I have a dialog box for the thing that's not. There we are. Oh, it went over that, that screen for some reason. Yes, confirm. Confirm. All right, hopefully that stopped the print. Yeah, it stopped. All right, cool. Um, so yeah, let's go right over to Odat Nerd. Uh, we'll see everybody over there.
Well, dude, thanks for coming by. Thank you so much for the questions tonight, everybody. Appreciate it. Um, I'll be back on Sunday, and uh, but only for a little while. So I'm probably going to start streaming earlier than usual on Sunday because um, I'm actually finishing up my Voron printer build with a couple of people in Denver. So I got to get down to the like the southeast corner of Denver by one o'clock. So um, similar to last week, I need to like stop streaming around noon my time. Um, so I'll probably start streaming a little bit earlier. I've got at least one or two resumes to do as resume reviews. Those tend to take 15 to 20 minutes. If you want a resume review for free, happy to do that. Um, even if you just want my perspective on your resume, if you think your resume is fine, but you just want another take, um, send it in. Happy to, uh, to do resume reviews. So here's a link for it. You can go check that out. Um, and juggling, thank you for your questions. Really great to see you in, uh, in chat again. Um, happy new year to everybody if you missed the stream last week. So I'll be back on Sunday. We'll do some resume reviews. It'll be all career prep. You won't hear me talk about 3D printing, uh, stuff like that. So we'll catch everybody over on Odat Nerd's channel. Uh, make some noise. Be friendly. He's a really great guy. Um, loves helping people out and, and loves chatting about uh, the, uh, the stuff that he's doing. He does a lot of chatbot kind of stuff and like really interactive uh, chatbot things and loves Python. I'm a huge Python nerd myself. So we'll go hang out over there and we'll catch you all on Sunday. Have a great weekend and we'll see you next time.